Welcome back to the Loud Sound Epicenter podcast. I am glad to be joined here once again by the shaman himself, Thomas 777. Thank you for making time during the holiday weekend for us over here. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Nothing to rather be doing. Yeah, same here, same here, because as you can probably tell, I'm a bit in a different scenario here. I'm in Carlsbad, California, instead of my hometown. So uh, I was actually on the streets searching for Nigel Carlsbad, but he was nowhere to be found. I was uh, hoping to run into him listening to his Blue Cheer CDs telling me how they invented metal or some nonsense. There's avocado trees out there. That's right. So that's yeah, correct. You have a Carlsbad, man. So uh, I'm, uh, you know, reaping the rewards of that right now. About to head back, unfortunately. But before I do... I got you guys to uh, keep me company, thankfully, making this a lot more bearable. So I appreciate. Uh, I see we got a bunch of questions here as well as on Discord. So we're going to try and get through hopefully all of them in the time that we have. So uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody here for tuning in on this momentous Likewise. occasion. I'll start with Discord. So I guess it's a bit of an AMA right now. But uh, let me see here. I saw Goosh Goosh, Dr. Goosh Goosh specifically. Um, so let me see here. Um, well, first of all, John, John in the Discord, I can't cannot pronounce the last name because uh, unfortunately, but he was asking, first of all, Thomas, what uh, you're eating for the 4th of July. Lots of pancakes. Pancakes? All right. All right. We're back. I'm thinking <laughs> we're back. That's what's on the agenda. All right. Yeah, all right. man. Excellent. Can all of okay. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, you're right, Brotherhood. Uh, don't look too closely. Um, there's a there's a certain podcast that apparently people are worried that if you say it, it'll uh, it'll uh, hit the sensor. So I'll type it in chat here. Uh, is that like the it's like the Bloody Mary game where like you <laughs> utter it and, and like the bitch pops out of the mirror and like slaughters you? It's they're making it sound like it's that nefarious. I'll just type it here in chat. You'll probably see it. I'll, uh, here, I'll uh, copy it over in the in the private one too. If uh, yeah, yeah, Vingle's in there saying it. Yeah, I don't know how else to abbreviate. I'm trying to I'm trying to get through the the little games here, but oh yeah, I'm familiar. If, if that's the one that that's actually a dope podcast i didn't realize that they were being targeted so aggressively um i mean they're definitely like they're definitely like very real dudes um but i didn't think they're not they're not like super extreme or something like but maybe uh, <clears throat> people have told me that like weird stuff is like triggering the sensors that's why like i recorded with pete canones today i want to shout out to him because he's he's a dear friend of ours but and just a great individual but you know He's been kind enough to help me with um, this ongoing revisionist series. And as we get into the nitty gritty of uh, of some of the, these topics, I, I told him, you know, he may not want to. It's, it's always going to be free. Like he, this content that he and I are laying down on revisionism. But it, we may not be able to post it up on YouTube because I, I, the last thing I want, obviously, is for his content to get stricken. And I know that they've been strange lately, um, or rather, like, inconsistent. Um, you know, but it's hard to say. The uh, There's this one... Uh, I, I, I peruse YouTube a fair amount. Um, and uh, there's a couple of... Uh, there's a couple of different streams that are not overtly political but pretty politically incorrect and they deal with like race and stuff one of which is um hosted by a guy who i got a lot of respect for uh poor guy did like 15 years in in state prison and then he went on to become like a paralegal and like really turn his life around and uh but he's like a very politically aware and like racially aware dude okay and some of the guests he has on are are are, are guys who are who are you know a little bit rough spoken and things about these matters and he's never gotten struck so but there's like a bunch of crazy stuff on there i mean still on youtube like it i mean obviously like nothing overly pornographic but there's some pretty there's some pretty like gross stuff that they just like allow to like stay up but then arbitrarily like us the other week like they'll they'll nuke uh they'll nuke or strike something just you know because it it uh it uh whatever is under discussion is just like you know triggers their 
their censorship hammer. I mean, it's very strange, man. But, yeah. but no, I uh, the podcast the the fellas reference whose name we shall not utter. There, that's a dope podcast. The uh, you guys are the ones who turned me out of that. It was uh like Joel Davis and uh a few a few other guys um were the ones who uh who uh who told me about it. Yeah, they they do great stuff and that's obviously like right up my alley. But, there you go. All right. Yeah. Uh Windhoek was asking if there is something of a Germanic temperament or whether it is an arbitrary imposition. And if it exists, what does it consist in? That's yeah, I mean definitely. <clears throat> but within that there's there's a there's a lot of cultural iterations. I mean, I think being, you know, being a, like an introverted kind of gloomy Protestant like I am, I mean, that's Germanic, you know, that that's kind of quintessentially Germanic, but kind of like the loud Bavarian, uh, uh, you know, Catholic uh, culture, like what we think of, you know, the stuff that's kind of caricatured in, in America is kind of like stereotypically uh, German. And that's very Bavarian. Okay. And that's, that's also like very different than what I just described, like in my own lineage, but they're, those are both very much a German temperament. I think more there, there's a Kevin McDonald, who I don't agree with on many things. I mean, I agree with his politics, but you know, obviously like he, uh, his, uh, his conceptual horizon very much owes to a, a kind of a, a, a biological materialism that I reject, but he talks about a Northern European like cultural orientation, you know, and he makes the point that, you know, the early founding stock of America, you know, they were from very, they were from many different nations, but they like the founding stock of America was the, the, the terror, <coughs> they were only majority of these people, uh, hailed from a, a territory smaller than the size of the state of Texas, okay, in Northern Europe. And there are commonalities there. I made the point before, part of it's owing to the fact that I, you know, I, I, I very much believe that, you know, sectarian confession shapes conceptual horizon and culture. You know what I, I've got a very, I'm very much culturally Calvinist, but that kind of Calvinist orientation, you, you see it, uh, you know, not just in, uh, you see it not just in stuff like, uh, uh, like Carlisle and, and things like that, you know, like you see it in, in stuff like Nut Hampson, you know, you see it in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, 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 <coughs> in some of these, uh, you know, Northern, uh, Northern German authors and things you see it in the Prussian tradition, although that's, that's kind of its own thing too. But, um, you know, and then there's a there's a Germanic mysticism. I made the point that Lutheranism, I, it owes more to. I, I've got a lot of respect for Lutherans and Lutheranism, but it's a very different tendency than you know to center Protestantism of of the Calvinist sort. You know, I, I think about more in the tradition of like Meister Eckert and kind of like German mysticism. Okay, um, but yeah, there is there is a Germanic character. Um, but like I said, I kind of. I kind of I kind of think of it more as the northern northern European character. Yeah, it's something that exists definitely. Julius yeah. Evola got into that too. You know, I mean that's a big part of his paradigm is, you know, uh the, the northern sensibility versus the southern sensibility, you know, the solar cult versus like the lunar cult and um you know uh symbolic psychological masculine and feminine paradigms and things like this. Yeah, it's a very real thing, okay. He uh, extends that and asks if it exists, do the English embody it, or maybe they're too far removed from it? I mean, what English are we talking about? I mean, England is not like a singular culture. That's one of the reasons why kind of the, that, that's one of the reasons why the War of Three Kingdoms was, was, was in some ways, you know, a microcosm of a 30 years war. Like, are we, are we, are we talking about, um, you know, with the people that Hamilton and Jay were describing, you know, like the Anglo-Saxons who really were kind of wild Germanics who always resented you know the imposition of of the kind of, of Latinate authority on them. You know, we're talking about uh, are we, are we talking about like you know the Vikings who imposed the Dane law and kind of just you know became quote unquote English. You know, uh, owing to the owing to the fact that you know they they uh, that's where that's kind of where they finally stopped when they were out you know conquering and pillaging. You know, we're we talking about uh, are we, are we talking about the descendants of Normans 
you know, uh, who were, who were, you know, basically continental Europeans who, you know, like Vikings that became civilized as it were. And, you know, like, um, you know, married the daughters of Frankish Kings or whatever, like, who are we talking about? And no, I think England's its own thing. I mean, I agree with Spangler in that regard. You know, you're, it's not only is it its own thing, but I uh, we're in some ways it's at odds with, you know, the German character, but, um, there is, there is a Germanic element in England that is very real and very much a blood and soil constitution. Um, and, uh, that's part of the, that, that's part of the, uh, that's part of the tragedy of, uh, of the fact that, uh, you know, England was instrumental in, in, in destroying Europe, I believe. Uh, he was also referring to the, uh, those affected by the Norman invasions. So uh, to, uh, that probably doesn't narrow it down, but um, just some more uh, information there. Let's see, here we get. Um, this is 420, uh, a regular in the Discord uh, is do you think it is possible for a populist president to destroy the 21st century immigration industrial complex in the same way FDR destroyed uh, Tammany Hall? Would uh, I think there's something comparable to that? Yeah, it's possible, definitely. And I also think uh, I think immigration is somewhat overstated. Um, I mean, it's definitely like the Great Replacement is a real thing, but it's in, in terms of pl the political culture of the regime that reigns. It's not like something that's been created by immigrants. And like I said again and again, one of the ways you know like elections are a sham in this country, like why are these losers like why, why do these losers like Mitch McConnell just like die in office after serving 60 years? Like why is if, if immigration is like what changed California from being the kind of Republican heartland, like why why are like why are like senile old white ladies like Nancy Pelosi, like why do they just like why do they just like go unchallenged? So it's like you're telling me this kind of like new like Latino majority. They don't, they don't want some like 35 year old, uh, you know, like labor organizer type Hispanic dude. They want, they want Barbara Boxer. They just love Nancy Pelosi. Like that's, that's much bullshit. But I'm not saying your point is bullshit. It's a very important point, but the, um, eventually, uh, I think what will happen is, uh, I'm talking like mid century. You're going to find like populism is going to come to rule the day, uh, just as 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 a system can kind of can no longer incentivize cooperation with it and uh you know you're gonna uh, on the one hand there's gonna be like a fracturing um there's gonna be a socio-political fracturing because there won't be any incentive for people to pretend uh that uh there's any kind of unifying moral consensus but at the same time you know people will realize that you know the elites are the common enemy or what was the elite and uh it's going to kind of, what's going to emerge is, is going to kind of be a good fences, make good neighbors policy. And yeah, it'll take the form of, um, it'll, it'll take the form of people no longer tolerating like what I just said, like these, these like bizarre, uh, these people, these bizarre losers and like literal clowns who are the, you know, who, who, who like literally serve for life in office, you know, they're, they're like I said, I mean, I'm not just making a joke or invoking hyperbole when I compare these people to like Chernenko and, like the late Soviet nomenclature, like they really are like that. And yeah, the, what the foreign populism will take, well, you know, like I said, it, it'll, uh, it'll, um, the, the various, uh, the various races, uh, is, you know, such that, uh, things break down in America, you know, along, along racial lines, they'll, uh, they'll take out the trash, uh, figuratively speaking. I'm not talking about like violence or something. Um, obviously because we wouldn't endorse that. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of like what, what, what's created in its stead will, will be a good fences equals good neighbors policy. In my opinion, you know, it's, uh, that's one, of, that's one of the reasons these clowns like are, are making so much like, and, and, and confabulating such a, such a hysterical narrative of January 6th. I mean, it's not just that they're, and they're really, really fucking up by doing that. Cause they're just making, they're making people really, really angry. And it, it looks it looks totally par it appears bad optics. It appears totally paranoid and disengaged. Um, so I mean, it's one part tone de tone deafness. It's one part like these losers really are like terrified of this country, like in normal people, because like they realize everybody hates them on some level, you know. Um, so yeah, that's I didn't mean that to be scattershot. I was kind of thinking aloud, but yeah, yeah, no, there's definitely you're definitely gonna see a return to like actual populism.
That's right. And uh, speaking of violence, I just want to call to attention to something in the chat. Pyramid Head, I've seen this guy firsthand in action. So I would ask everybody to, uh, you know, be careful when you're around him. He's a very violent individual. He's got this giant blade that he wields around with him. So I would just, you know, maybe we should uh, be careful when we're around this guy. He's uh, he's quite a threat. I've seen it firsthand. So hopefully we can, uh, you know, resort to a diplomacy, at least for tonight because uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in chat. But uh, looks like we got another one from Dr. Goosh Goosh asking you your favorite leader of Rome or antiquity. Um, of, of, of just antiquity generally, I mean, it's Alexander, hands down. Of Rome, uh, I mean, Augustus Caesar. And I'm not, I'm not strong on Roman history, but I mean, Augustus Caesar is, is, is head and shoulders above all, uh, all others, in my opinion. But uh, Alexander, Alexander's the greatest conqueror who ever lived, and he was a, he was a philosopher in his own right. And he also Alexander had a, Alexander had more in common. You know, Alexander's mother wasn't Greek, and uh, Alexander may very well have committed patricide. He was a very tragic guy, but he there's interesting parallels uh, between him and Napoleon, and to a lesser degree, him and Adolf Hitler. But also, just I mean, on its own. You know, Alexander, you understand how, you know, Evola, as well as some of these thinkers, like, uh, I'm not a Jungian at all, but I, there are some things in Jung's paradigm that I take seriously. You know, Jung's always making the point that um, these symbolic psychological archetypes, you know, such that they constitute like a discrete personage, you know, and and and, and kind of develop in, uh, in historical memory, you know, into, into like, you know, gods and heroes how what there what you know at some point there probably was a model for these for these uh for these uh characterizations um you come to understand that when you when you read about a man like alexander like it seems like it seems preposterous these days that somebody would become quite literally immortal you know in the perennial consciousness of a race or of, of a people but um that it's it was by no means it's rare in any epoch, but it it was yeah it was absolutely possible um, in classical antiquity, and and somebody like Alexander is a testament to that. I mean, maybe I I I very much abide Carlyle as well as Hegel, so I, mean, I believe very much of you know the heroic personage in history. So I mean, you could say that's my own conceptual bias, but you know there's a there's a reason why you know, Alexander looms so large in the mind of any historian. I mean, even people like me, who, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I, I, I've got no expertise in classical antiquity. I, I'm a revisionist and my primary area of study and dare I say expertise is, uh, you know, the modern period and particularly the 20th century. But yeah, that's a fascinating question. That's right. And uh, Manon, while you're still here, I just want you to know there's all these cute goth girls asking for your name in the discord. So uh, you're, you're missing out, big guy. If you're going to want to be privy to that, I would recommend you uh, stay in tune here. You know, they're not going to hang around forever. So um, I noticed that Vingol, our favorite poke salad Annie respecter, was asking if you've ever read a book from the early 20th century with the same title as the podcast we were talking about earlier. Yeah, by Rosenberg. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple times. There we go. There we go. Um, let me scroll. Okay, so there's Vingles. Uh, somewhat a a n d r was uh, well, I guess this is less of a question, but uh, actually, I can I can send you this one. This one's a bit uh, extended. Uh, I'll, I'll forward it to you just because it's a bit of a word salad. But I appreciate that A N D R. I'm not uh, neglecting your question. I just want to. Because it's technically like a recommendation, so we'll uh, we'll save that one. Um, uh, is Tolkien's work in line with the German sensibility? Asks TB88. I mean, yeah the the Ring Cycle is uh, it may run upon the same mythology as Wagner, okay? But it's it's but it, uh, it it's redacted the kind of ethno sectarian controversy of it because it, it would emerge. I mean, it's obvious what that's why the it doesn't make any sense why like everybody covets the ring. I mean, because it's, it's, you're talking about a metaphor about usury, you know, about, uh, you know, about, you know, the, the, the Judaic spirit, you know, versus the European spirit and specifically, you know, the Germanic heroic spirit, like that's what it's about, you know, just like Wagner's and Wagner's ring cycle is a very Wagner's opera based on, you know, the ring cycle is very much on the nose about that. Um, I mean, total kind of stuff's interesting, 
and it, it's definitely like worth reading and it's if it, i'm not in, i'm not into it i'm but i'm into stuff like dune you know like um but it uh i mean uh, tolkien himself he said uh his notion was to you know write like in, in anglo-saxon mythology i mean i, I think you learned to succeed in that um but like i said i'm not uh i don't the only kind of fiction i read man like i said i'm always dropping shane stevens because Dead City is is one of the few books like I read regularly, like which might sound weird, but it's it, it's it it really is like a street survival manual, like corny as that sounds. And I'm not uh I'm not I'm not some gangster guy or some like tough guy or or like some guy from the hood like at all. But I, I do think of myself as something of a survivalist, an urban survivalist. And it, I mean I don't know I just I got a special bond with that book for whatever reason. Okay, but um. Other than stuff like that and the short timers by Gustav Hasford, you know, I, 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 I don't, I never like got into Tolkien. You know, I got into stuff like Frank Herbert's Dune, you know, and uh, that's why I write science fiction, you know. Um, but I know that like I know a lot of guys, particularly you know, guys who are who are into um, not just philosophy, but into you know, into, into kind of Indo-European culture and, and who are into, you know, studying up on, on our racial heritage and stuff. That's very positive and that's dope. But I know that a lot of people like Tolkien for varied reasons. But I don't, <clears throat> I, that was never, um, that was never really my big thing. Um, I really, I'll tell you what I really like. I, I really like C.S. Lewis and he wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And this is on my mind, uh, because uh Lewis I believe converted to Catholicism but uh he uh he retained a certain sympathy for the Anglican right and uh Paul our, our, our comrade and dear friend Paul Fahrenheit was on my mind because of a discussion he and I were having on on Anglicanism anyway CS Lewis wrote a really he wrote a really good book just literally called mirror Christianity, which is based on a series of radio lectures that he dropped, I think in the fifties. Okay. Um, and if you've got even a passing interest in the Christian faith, um, of whatever denomination, you know, I, I, I found it highly relatable and I'm a presby. So I highly recommend that. And, uh, CS Lewis is, uh, he wrote some science fiction, which is really kind of more science fantasy, you know, so like out of the silent planet. And then I thought that was really great. Um, obviously what he's most known for is, you know, stuff uh, like the Narnia stuff, which is dope. And like those movies, like the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, um, I, I, those movies were dope as hell. Like I went to see a bunch of them, like in the theater and like, if I, a girl I was seeing at the time, she was really into that stuff. <clears throat> and I was kind of like, I don't want to, I'm like, that's some fucking kid stuff. I don't want to see that. But then like, I, I watched it. I'm like, that's fucking dope. I'd forgotten like how how cool it was. And so then I started digging around, um, into CS Lewis's like broader catalog. And this is like, I like 20 years ago. So, I mean, like as an adult, you know, like, cause I, I, I remember him vaguely as a kid, stuff like the line in which in the wardrobe, but he's great. Um, as far as, uh, so I'm, I'm way more into that than Tolkien, but generally I'm like, I'm a Frank Herbert guy, you know, I'm a Frank Herbert guy. and like a Shane Stevens, Gustav Hasford guy. But part of that's because um, I'm a I'm kind of I'm kind of too much of like a Yankee urbanite. Maybe I don't know. <clears throat> I'm not some provincial Jagoff who you know can't process stuff that's not you know immediately relatable. But I mean, we do we do have we we do all have conceptual and aesthetic preferences and biases. You know what I I don't pretend otherwise. Um, I actually misremembered. The uh, Vingal question. He was asking for your take on not if you just read the uh, that early twentieth century book of the same podcast. So, oh, uh, I, I I'm not a fan of Rosenberg, and I one of the things court history is correct. Court history does very badly. Part of it's because of just they because they want to cast the entire regime of the Third Reich in into disrepute and render these kinds of punitive assessments passed off as as objective uh, critiques. Um, so you, you've got to kind of take with a grain of salt when any of these treatments are kind of the personages that constituted the regime at the highest levels, okay? But the the kind of off-repeated claim that when 
Hitler was uh, sentenced to Landsberg prison, why he installed Rosenberg as uh, as as party chief was because he was a weak person who didn't who not only didn't excuse me didn't covet um, power in that way in, in the executive role, but also wasn't a man who uh, you know the uh, the rank and file, particularly the old fighters, would would follow. I think that's basically correct. And also, Rosenberg wasn't corrupt. He was honest. Okay. And I, 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 more charitably, I, Hitler knew that he wasn't going to be subverted by Rosenberg. And that if somebody was trying to subvert uh, the party, Rosenberg would, would, would work to forestall that as well as notifying his fear of what was underway. Um, Rosenberg's problem is that he, on the one hand, was, I, I view him as basically. I view him as basically a, an atheist, like most 20th century types were. Um, and uh, it's not like it's a terrible Booker thing, but it's it's more kind of it's uh, it's some it falls in some it falls somewhere in between kind of the absolute dogmatic, you know, racial materialism of somebody like Madison Grant, and uh, you know the uh, the kind of absolute mysticism of of somebody like Evel, uh, but it, it doesn't. But it, but without conferring the insights of either, you know, and it's, it, I don't know. I mean, I think he's basically onto something, you know, when he talks about, uh, it, it, he, he makes some interesting points about geopolitics, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, the kind of many like races of Europe and how this was formative. You know, he talks a lot about how Europe is, you know, an indefensible peninsula and things and how this, you know, shaped, uh, not only the German character, but the, you know, it, it kind of it kind of led to an inevitable uh, tragedy, but, you know, befalling the, the Slavs and, and the German people who are always going to be at loggerheads. And, and this dynamic obviously is going to culminate in, in genocide. But I also think he was totally politically naive. And, you know, the, uh, it, uh, it's despite what people claim about, you know, I made this point on, on Pete Q's podcast, despite what people claim about, you know, the, uh, the Wehrmacht, uh, to say nothing of the SS and the SD, this claim that the Wehrmacht, they were these kind of uh, brutal Prussian officers who were kind of obsessed with their own, you know, purported, you know, racial supremacy as, as this overcast. And, and they, you know, they, 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 they simply went east. And, you know, the minute they, you know, the minute they crossed the Polish frontier, you know, into, into, into places like Belarus and Ukraine, they, they just started like massacring people because they were, you know, just these, these barbaric racists. Like that's not what happened at all. That's a gross mischaracterization. And uh, what's equally naive is uh, Rosenberg's idea that somehow the nationalities such that they can were such that they continue to exist and hadn't been totally either cast off into, into these remote oblasts, you know, as befell many of these people in, including, um, including a population of Volga Germans who unfortunately found themselves in under Soviet dominion. But uh, Rosenberg seemed to have this idea that people like, you know, the, the white Russians, uh, people like the Ukrainians, you know, people like the Kazakhs could, could just be like decoupled from Moscow's orbit and turned into client states. And I mean, it made the point again and again to people, first of all, the Germans, the, the Germans had huge support in Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine was divided, you know, between, um, uh, it was it, the population's loyalties were divided, but they there was a huge amount of support among the population for the Wehrmacht. Comparatively, you know the Germans weren't just going around acting like Genghis Khan. And secondly, even if they were, uh, you don't understand. Any, anyone thinks that you know twenty million Ukrainians uh, should have been uh, armed to the teeth and uh, and just entrusted to you know guard uh, German security against Ivan? Like this is, is got no understanding of of the stakes that were. Um, involved in the war, nor the kind of root causes of it. Um, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't defeat the Soviet Union by just like arming everybody who's not rushing to the teeth and like hoping they behave themselves and you know can, and teaching them how to you know teaching them how to you know teaching them how to give a Roman salute in lieu of uh, in lieu of uh, admonishing them to identify as you know as proletarians. Like it's, I mean, that's my view. I mean, realize I was long winded, but it's actually. Rosenberg was actually a pretty complex individual. Um, I, he was naive, but he certainly wasn't stupid. And he was another man who was 
you know, obviously he was unceremoniously hanged at Nuremberg for writing books with ideas that apparently were wrong because they, I mean, they, Julius Stryker got hanged for publishing a newspaper. I mean, so <laughs> if you're going to hang people for publishing newspapers with, you know, crude cartoons in them, it certainly stands a reason you're going to hang people for writing actual books that, you know, contain uh, material that uh, is offending to communists and Zionists, too. But yeah, that's uh, I didn't I didn't mean to <coughs> ramble and we'll see on Rosenberg. We should uh, we should do a dedicated mind phaser on Rosenberg sometime. There you go. Um, one of my favorites, D Douglas Edward, our favorite John Goodman expert, asking <laughs> if you've seen the Hindenburg movie with George C. Scott. No, one of you guys, it might have actually been the man himself. Uh, one of you guys uh, hipped me to the – I'd forgotten that movie even existed. And no, I've never seen it. But, like, my dad really digs George C. Scott. And I do, too. He's been in some of my favorite flicks. You know, like Legion, Exorcist 3, which is dope. And some, that's what he's finally getting to do. He was in a hardcore, which is a great movie. Um, the Patton biopic, I mean, it's somewhat of a hero worship hagiography, but that that's that's actually a good that's actually a good film. You know, the Germans are are instead of being these corny these corny British actors or these guys like speaking with like Hogan's heroes accents, they're actually speaking like fluent German, which is nice. But no, I'd forgotten. Uh, I mean, that's a crazy story, and like I'm fascinated by airships because the the brief like the decade and a half that airships were a form of consumer, like commuter travel, you know, it was like a luxury thing. And I, there's this whole website dedicated to uh, the luxury, uh, the luxury lines of, uh, of airships. And yeah, like the, you know, that's why the empire state building has a spire. It's to, for docking airships. And it's, there's something just like wild about it, man. Like for three days, you'd, you'd ride an airship for three days to cross from uh, like a, uh, the cross from uh, Munich to uh, to New York City, and uh, it's like something out of like a movie, you know. I mean, you're just like traveling by blimp, you know. It's like silently like through the air, and uh, it's they show the interior of the Hindenburg, and um, they uh, there's like this airtight, there's this airtight compartment that was like the smoking lounge, because obviously like you know they had to seal it off so there wasn't you know because you're dealing with like a massively combustible, uh, uh fuel source um and uh the uh the uh in like the drawing room or whatever uh i'll, I'll drop a link at some point like on my telegram like the you know and then the menu was like all this like you know luxurious food and obviously in the drawing room there was like a portion of adolf hitler because i was like you know right after he became chancellor like it i uh i wish uh i i really wish i'd had an opportunity to fly in the concord because the concord was freaking dope and uh, I really wish that I have a chance to like fly on an airship. Like if I had my time machine, those are two of the things I'd do. You know, the Concorde flew so high, like you could you could you could observe the curvature of the planet, um, and like all kinds of cool stuff like that. I mean, isn't it just cool to fly from uh, you know, to fly from uh, like New York to London in like three hours or whatever? Like it's a, uh, it uh, yeah, those are two things I fantasized about. Uh, but um. Yeah, I'll have to watch the Hindenburg movie. I mean, it, it's it's I mean, it's a, a real tragedy what befell the the Hindenburg, obviously, and um, then that I'm sure makes for a good a, a good movie. But also, just fucking airships are dope, man. There it's you dark. go, uh, Paul Jonathan Paul. Uh, Barack Obama reminded me. Are you still here in Carlsbad? I was just curious. You don't have to. I mean, I guess that's literally doxing yourself. Maybe not. Maybe you could send me a direct a direct message to confirm. But uh, uh, Garak was uh, helping me out here with that. But uh, yeah, we we love Jonathan Paul. Years of silence. Uh, I think everyone's in the know. Um, <laughs> uh, brother was a brotherhood of nod is asking any thoughts on the golden one i assumed he was talking about golden one credit union but if you want to if you want to take this one thomas you you could uh take it in a different direction i i, I don't <coughs> i don't i don't think i understand the question oh uh yeah i'm i wasn't actually sure but uh maybe i think he's still here we'll uh we'll probably verify that later on okay for sure um let's see here let me okay there's a question in here we'll probably get to later on it's a bit more vague um 
Wonder people. Yes, the. Uh, can we get uh, your take on the current uh, appraisal of the Russia Ukraine situation? That's right. The last show we uh, were short on time. If you wanted to address that here, I mean, uh, yeah, I. My opinion hasn't changed in the fact that I. The problem with Putin is that he's he's um. He's using the prospect of escalation as a political bargaining chip. Um, and he's been doing that from jump. And and part of it too is that I he's you know, he's he's been fixated um on presenting the narrative as, you know, this isn't he's refusing to even acknowledge that it's a state of general war, saying this is like a special operations mission. You know, there's these extremists, you know, the Kremlin calls them Nazis, but I mean that when the Kremlin does that, it's not it's not like our regime doing that. I mean, because they, they actually did fight the great patriotic war and it so it, it's there's more of a codex to them. It's not. It's not like. It's not like a. It's not like a Zionist American anti-fascism that they utilize that that nomenclature. I mean, I real. I realize it's stupid anyway, but just for just for clarity. But uh, the reason why the Kremlin has been suggesting that, and this has backfired already in some ways, because these people in the Donbass, um, you know, uh, Moscow was clear uh, from the moment they they launched uh, the you know this intervention. That uh, they're not there to like annex uh, you know the the majority Russian uh regions into the Russian Federation. So these people know these people knew on the ground that well you know the um and like you know the the mayors or the uh you know the the political honchos of these of these towns and villages and all blasts or whatever, however these such administrative districts break down in Ukraine. <laughs> You know, they know that they're not going to be assimilated in the Russian Federation, and they know that the Russian armed forces aren't going to stay there indefinitely. So they know that, like, if they collaborate too extensively, that, you know, the minute uh, the minute they're no longer under Moscow's protection, you know, Zelensky's secret police are going to show up and slaughter them. You know, so there's that. Um, no matter what, no matter, whether, no matter how heavy or light, so to speak, the Russian armed forces went into Ukraine, there would have been this hysterical... Uh, and punitive reaction and this deranged reaction, you know, by, uh, by America and its, and its crony regimes, because, um, the whole reason why this conflict escalated to what it did in February is because this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is at base a Zionist crusade to destroy Russia. Okay. That that's what's been underway, you know, for, for two decades now. Um, so if you're going to go into Ukraine, like go all in. Okay. Um, that's I realize there's always something of a there's always something of a disconnect between what's you know most strategically correct and what's politically viable. But um, this is one of those cases where um, there's not really that great of a divergence. Just only the fact that, like I said, there's there's not there's not any number of uh, there's not any number of responses of a purely political nature that that can be anticipated. You know, regardless of the depth and scale and scope of application of force by Russia. So, but it's also too the uh, you know Zelen Zelensky is not just a clown; he's also some kind of sociopath. And but he also like he doesn't he's not a real executive. He's literally like an American puppet, and his whole function is to simply har continue to harm Russia. You know by 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 forcing it to bleed men and materiel on the Ukrainian battlefront. So. Uh, he doesn't care. Like he's got no incentive to. Uh, he's got no incentive to. His whole policy is war at all costs because this isn't a rational operation on on the on the on on the on Zelensky's side. He's just like literally availing the country as you know to smash itself against the uh, against the Russian Leviathan. You know over and over again to to try to harm it. So, um, how I think it will develop is uh. I made the point the other day that in a perfect world, uh, the Russians would be able to get uh, Belarus intervene and effectively cut the country in half. I don't see that happening for a lot of reasons, and um, that's uh, that owes the part of Putin's shortcoming as an exec as an executive. It's that he, the guy doesn't have a military background; his background is that of a cop. Politically, he's he's had some masterful. Uh, He's had some master strokes. You know, I, I take nothing away from him. Um, 
in comparative terms. He's, he's been a great executive in a lot of ways, but um, whoever replaces him uh, is going to, if, if the Russian, you know, for the sake of the Russians, they, it's going to have to be a man who's got a better understanding of military matters. And I believe that's in the cards anyway. The, uh, the, the Russian defense ministry and, and, and the design bureaus that uh, provide it with its, its war tech and everything, they've got an extraordinary amount of power, uh, way more so than, you know, the, the defense lobby does in America. And, uh, obviously like the Pentagon and, and the various defense industry lobbies have a great deal of power in America, but in Russia, I mean, just as in the Soviet days, obviously not to that scale, but they, they wield tremendous authority in a way that would be, we view as alien in, uh, you know, uh, in America. And, uh, it um the man who plays as Putin is very much going to be uh is very is very much going to be a man who's uh who's from that uh, culture okay um <clears throat> how how our hostility is going to resolve um Russia's basically going to uh they're going to they're going to continue uh slowly but surely some people would argue ineptly I wouldn't be that punitive but they're going to continue to slowly but surely uh destroy ukrainian forces and being um they're going to uh, establish some kind of perimeter that's far enough out from the polish border that it's not going to trigger uh you know it's not going to cross some conflict dyad that's going to trigger a war with poland but that's proximate enough that they can basically saturate anything coming over the coming over the polish border into western ukraine they can basically saturate that entire um that entire operational space with, 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 with missiles and, and mass artillery. And that's exactly what they're going to do. Um, at some point, will Ukrainians get tired of simply smashing themselves against Ivan? I, I would think so, but I, I, mean, I find it incredible that these people are dying on mass and, you know, uh, destroying their own country for the sake of some Zionist who's, who's, uh, who is trying to lead them in a crusade against their fellow Christian Slavs. It's, it's incredible to me, but I, you know, you can't, some people are natural slaves. Apparently that's what the Ukrainians are. I mean, they're proving that every day. That's my take in a nutshell. Yeah, there you go. Um, Paul, Paul, uh, I uh, sent you something on Twitter. We'll, uh, we'll verify something. Um, what do you think of the new Dune, Brian Herbert, or the Dune movie? I, I can't remember if we went over this, but uh, this the uh, the Dune movie I thought was not bad, but it was lacking a lot of things, and uh, namely, like uh, the guy who played the Baron Harkonnen, I thought that was the way they portrayed the Harkonnens was just off. And one thing, David Lynch, uh, uh, David Lynch's Dune had going for it. Frank Herbert died shortly after the Lynch Dune was released. But he did uh, he did have a chance to screen it, and he said that there were problems with it. But one thing it got right was some of the optics, and that's why the artwork on the Dune novels is based on like to this day is like based on like Lynch Dune, and uh, like Giddy Prime is supposed to be a nightmarish place, and the Harkonnens are uh, they're this incredibly brutal militaristic society that's in terminal decline, and uh, and the Baron is a uh, the Baron's a political genius, but he's also a petter ass and he's a sick fuck. You know, like he's, he's a psychopath, you know, like he's not the way they cast him in, in the new Dune is he's like Paul Castellano or something. He's like this low key kind of like, you know, uh, like almost barely awake, uh, you know, kind of like aging, like Caesar. Like that's not that that's not, so that was totally off the Brian Herbert prequels and sequels. I think most of them are garbage, but, uh, the, uh, the, uh, a couple of them are dope. And, uh, the, the one, um, the machine crusade and the Butlerian Jihad, they're the ones that, uh, deal with the Cymex, you know, who were, uh, they were the, they're the humans who, uh, they're the human Titans who, uh, who conquered, uh, old earth. And uh, they, uh, the machine intelligence that ultimately, you know, took over, uh, 
all the all all the, all human affairs. It was created by the Titans, and the Titans had their they had their they had their brains literally uh, implanted into a uh, robot bodies called Cymex, and their consciousness you know uploaded so they would be immortal into machine bodies, and you know ultimately uh, ultimately the Cymex were were smashed by the machine intelligence, and like that's 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 what led to like the entire slavery of humanity. But two of the books get into that, and uh, the character of Erasmus. Erasmus kills Serena Butler's infant son because he, he doesn't really understand. Uh, he, Erasmus is prone to doing stuff like he'll vivisect humans when they're alive because he's curious about pain and horror. Uh, and he he doesn't understand uh, he doesn't understand like human values, particularly kinship bonds. Like he understands them uh, as a machine would, but uh, he finds Serena Butler interesting. Um, and uh, he starts to develop feelings for her. And uh, he gets mad because she pays more attention to her infant son than him. He doesn't realize that, like, he's developing human emotions. But long story short, like, he murders her son by dropping him out of a window just kind of casually. And that's what starts the Butlerian Jihad. But, like, uh, the story of Erasmus is it's more compelling than it sounds. Like, this Erasmus was an ordinary machine. But uh, he got a... Uh, on uh on uh on one of the on one of the home worlds, not Arrakis. He was in the desert and he fell into this crevice for thirty years. And uh during that time he only had himself for company until he was like recovered and reconstituted. And uh like as he had as he held this dialogue with himself and as he was away from any machine authority that would regulate his programming, uh he became more like an organic life form and i find that really compelling but uh i tried reading some of the other brian herbert books and i thought they were just like really freaking stupid and gay um so yeah that's that's my take on it let's see so the golden one the swedish uh youtuber i'm not uh, i'm not up to speed so uh or streamer i should say uh so uh, I'll I'll check that out. I guess I'm uh, out of the loop. Yeah, I am too on a lot of things, frankly, man. And like I've been kind of cloistered, um, working on my Steel Storm manuscript and some other stuff. So, but um, I'll and then speaking of that, I'll be starting tomorrow. I'll be I'll be uh, I'll be back to regular regular regularly scheduled programming on Tgram. We but we go. got we got a great community there, man. Like Tgram's really been blowing up. It's not, and I figured it would, man. Um, as a, as a, I, I'm, I'm thinking conventional or traditional social media has kind of run its course, especially considering its its tendency towards uh, heavy handed censorship. But even that aside, uh, you know, you're seeing a real journalism like conflict journalism has made it come back and it's cause of stuff like TRAM, you know, and that's, that's dope, man. It, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that Trump is like, it's really active on TGRAM now too. I mean, it's nothing, it's, it's more the, and like that's it, TGRAM's willing, like it, that's why true social didn't go anywhere. It's not just because, uh, it's not, it's not just because generally people who are interested in that kind of platform are going to gravitate to Twitter, but it's, that kind of like microblogging platforms just kind of dying, man. I think, but it, uh, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, Trump's uh, Trump's got a big following on Tgram, and he's been, he's been active there. I mean, he's not dropping anything. He doesn't have any like hot takes. He gave us that's funny stuff, but but yeah, no, I'm a big fan of Tgram, man. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a game changer for sure. All the uh, all the people taking refuge there. I'm looking. Um, for someone's i gotta uh i gotta go smoke and feed my habit um I'll yo no back. problem i'll uh, i'll yeah. answer this question that was a bit open-ended so uh yeah i'll be i'll, I'll, I'll be quick man. so somebody asked apologies for not finding it right away but it was about the goth girl aesthetic what's the stance what's the dissident right take here's the thing you got a handful of bands it's kind of like punk you just gotta have to narrow it down to the the true believers and so you have your Sisters of Mercy, Susie and the Banshees, Concrete Blonde. You got a handful of bands that could really 
Stan both aesthetically and musically. And then as you know, in the 90s, we just get this perversion. We get this total gaslighting where the goth identity gets totally, you know, sucked into this ether and uh, it gets really changed by the alternative scene, which is very unfortunate because as Thomas has said before, I'm not even sure how much of that is organic because it could have just been a local culture that didn't have to go nationwide. You know, it, it can stay local. There's nothing wrong with that, but. I think the goth identity specifically, Stain Haynes, we were uh, talking about this in a Twitter space. It really is like a war crime against that demographic. You know, people who would have the kind of beating a dead horse at this point, but would be Avril Lavigne's are just being completely discarded from the demographic and just becoming this like one dimensional stock character that is, you know, take your pick of the latest, uh, pop music that's going out these days. What you had in the early 2000s was a nice balance. You kind of had a yin and a yang. Today, you don't really have that. And prior to the, you know, the alternative gaslighting, you were able to have all those different scenes, the sort of CBGBs, hodgepodge we've talked about before. And so aesthetically, yeah, maybe that's for most people, that's what they like. But I, I would argue that there is a lot of substance, you know, beneath the surface. It's just, I don't know how much of that people are really aware of. You know, I just recently went to a concert that was like that. And that was the big question is, does metal overlap with the goth bands? And I say it depends, you know, if you've ever listened to the first Cure album, I mean, if you ask me, it's borderline metal, not, not technically, but I'm saying aesthetic, like not even aesthetic, but the, the direction is very in tune with a lot of the metal stuff. It's a bit hard to explain, but it's it's like how Motorhead is receptive to punk fans. I mean, I know musically it's a bit on the cusp, especially with that first album. But you you understand what I mean. Some of these punk bands can really lean into the metal crowd, even if there is that rivalry. I know that that's kind of been settled ever since the internet kind of smashed that boundary. But the goth, the goth question, it's it's very... It's very hard to explain, and it seems like a lot of people really latch onto it because of the fashion. That's a little unfortunate because there is a lot of very 80s and then, unfortunately, some 90s stuff in there that kind of drives it off track. So it's it's a bit of a mixed bag. It also depends on who you ask. If you if you go up to somebody, you know the 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 old you walk up to someone with a metal t shirt and they don't you know can't name a few songs. A lot of that is happening in in, in droves with the, with the goth community. So it's a bit unfortunate. I'm not as well read on some of the early 2000s arcs that you had, some of the stuff that came from the punk scenes and then became alternative and then got into the screamo stuff. That I couldn't really paint you a linear line, but if you want to talk about like early 70s, kind of the original, the people who were listening to the Velvet Underground and then got into this weird stuff, I think that uh, I could probably explain a lot more. But ironically, my generation's music, uh, I don't know exactly what uh, they're leeching on to, if it's not just the look. You know, musically, I think that's up in the air. But anyways, that was uh, perfect. Perfect timing on that one. Killing Joke. Thank you, lady. Yeah, Killing Joke's another, like, metal, industrial, goth. It's It's all over the place, but it's... I, it, that's funny. I just put that song on my Instagram story. Uh, yeah, The Weight. Metallica covered The Weight. And, uh, you know, they wear their influences on their sleeves. So it's it's very cool. Even The Misfits, you know, that stuff, that band got big thanks to Metallica. So very cool to see that stuff get uh, get its fair hearing. What do we... Okay, we, we're getting some blowback. Okay, MF, in my... Hold on, hold on a second. In my experience, like dominant... Okay. MF, you might be onto something there. I, I cannot give you a, a detailed answer on that, but I think you're onto something there. So I'll, uh, I think you get it for sure. The way, yeah. Okay. We're, we're back. Uh, we are 138 on this stream. We're all <laughs> every single one of us. So great to hear. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Killing joke. That's funny. If Jay Burden's still in here, Jay Burden sent me like a recent, relatively recent Killing Joke album, 
which is a bit more uh, screamo compared to the early stuff. But still, yeah, they, they, they blew up. They blew up for a minute, man. Like I hadn't yeah. thought about killing joke for a while, but yeah, they they were big, man. Start. <laughs> okay, thank you, Manon. Thank you for the uh, the kind words. Um, 2005. Yes, thank you, thank you, bass guitarist. All right, let me. Where do we? Where do we leave off here? Someone asked, was asking about a uh, Russia's uh, strength, but I I don't. I can't find the exact question here. I, uh, as far as like natural resources, like how are they going to sustain, how are they going to have a leg to stand on after, you know, all this pressure from the sanctions and the, you know, I mean, but what, what, what's, what kind of interdependence is there between America and Russia? Like, that's why it's kind of, I mean, sanctions are kind of the recourse of, 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 of the impotent anyway, but you know, like what, what kind of trade is America engaged in with Russia? You know, I mean, it's okay. Like, you know, they can pressure the we can pressure the Bundes Republic, you know, to to um to drop uh to drop the Gazprom uh deal, but I mean, that's that's an own goal. I mean, for Berlin. Beyond that, like, it's it, Russia is not Japan. You know, it's not. There, there's not. We're not cutting Russia off from like access to some coveted American market that they need to sell stuff in. Like, you know, Russia produces like natural gas, oil, and weapons. I mean, it, <laughs> and this idea that I mean, I made the point before, man. I mean, yeah, I realize that there are absolute metrics, and you know, not everything's relative, and you can't you can't extrapolate. Um, you know. Uh, you can, you can't extrapolate um critical events and and mortal crises to to uh as proof positive that you know a, a political structure is somehow uh invincible or something but you know R Russia lurched on for with something like 1.9% growth you know during this for decades during the Soviet era of stagnation in 4 years during uh the the war of uh, with uh the german reich they lost like one in seven of their population you know this idea that uh you know this this idea that um this this idea that uh you know these these uh you know that these you know these these <coughs> these that's sanctioning russia and uh and flooding um and flooding uh and flooding the ukrainian battle space with small arms um, is, is somehow going to destroy Russia. Like that's, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, it, uh, it's not. And, uh, I don't know. I mean, Russia, Russia's always, Russia's always fucked up and dysfunctional. Like it was, it was fucked up and dysfunctional a thousand years ago. It was, it was a hundred years ago. It is today. I mean, I, you know, you can write off the Russians too. And yeah, obviously, Russia today is nothing like it was at the zenith of uh, Soviet power. Like I think of Russia, I think I think of the Russian Federation as like Van Hagar, and like uh, Brezhnev Soviet Union as like Van Halen. But uh, that being said, it um you know you can't write off the Russians. Like a lot of you know uh, the uh, the Warsaw Pact uh, was in in terms of. Uh, in terms of hard power, I, I mean, it was it was it was it was the mightiest military alliance that ever existed. Um, when the Soviets accomplished uh, true strategic parity, you know, in the Brezhnev era, yeah, they they always uh, they could never match uh, NATO in terms of uh, in terms of deeper parodies, you know, like. Uh, these MIRVs and, and and decoys and things and you know the uh, aside from the fact that you know NATO had a had a geostrategic advantage in terms of where they could base uh, intermediate range platforms and things like that, but you know the Russians uh, it, it, it and at the same time it didn't matter and uh, they they were able to uh, they were able to develop delivery systems that were consistently reliable. That were housed in super hardened structures, and the throw weight of their warheads was was massive and terrifying. And um, they also too the they do things like fielding like the Typhoon class submarine, which to this day uh, 
in terms of displacement and everything else is is the lar- is by, by far the largest submarine ever fielded and uh it uh it was a truly devastating weapons platform like most submarine most submarine launched ballistic missiles were lacking in throw weight um what they had going for them was uh was uh was um they played a big role in in the balance of terror because you know they um they were uh they were first strike weapons and they were largely invisible um until they uh you know surface in order to deploy their uh, deadly ordinance but uh the soviets were increasingly moving to submarine platforms that you know house missiles that you know truly were like a could could uh could levy a devastating counter counter value strike against their target i mean they before <coughs> You know, early in this, or not so early, like in the in the nineteen seventies, like what would NASA learn about Venus? Because I mean, Venus was viewed as an Earth like world, you know, and and obviously, like it's it's not. I mean, we take that for granted now, but it, you know, we we owe what we learned about Venus early on to to the Soviets, you know, and their and their space program, you know, because uh, they actually landed um they actually landed a uh, craft on Venus repeatedly and i mean they they'd go they'd go dead within minutes because the you know the climate there's so unforgiving but but my point is like russia russia and the soviet union has always been this bizarre state that on on the one hand is totally backwards and on the other hand is you know at, at the zenith of a uh, of war tech and uh it, yeah it's incongruous it's strange but it, it it doesn't matter and so long as russia so long as russia uh exists it, it's it's you can never, you only be able to write it off as um as a military power you know and um that's uh plus <clears throat> russia has to fight in ukraine for existential reasons i mean even if they were even if they were absorbing terrible losses and even if it was completely fucking up their national economic profile it, i mean at there's points in there's junctures where you just have to fight okay so Russia has to fight. Russia has to win. It's going to keep throwing men and material into the battle space until that happens. So there you go. No, I, I hear you. And a lot of people in the chat agree with your analysis. You know, Russia and Ukraine used to be one, just like how Kip Winger was in the Alice Cooper band. But then when, <laughs> I've forgotten that. <laughs> when, 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 when Ukraine kind of broke off, that's when you get like the, that's when you get the Winger solo band. And so you yeah, kind of yeah. have this rivalry that didn't need to exist. You know, Kane Roberts isn't in the picture anymore. So it's very unfortunate when a lot of these alliances just kind of turn into rivalries. It's a, it's a bit needless, but, uh, no, you're right. We uh, we used to have a much more sane, uh, you know, unipolar world, but you know, you gotta you gotta watch out for stuff like that. Thank you for. I mean, that's why. Yeah, go not to it. not to show myself, but I and the reason why the framing device, my science fiction brand, is an alternative an alternative outcome to the sort of final uh, cycle of crises of the Cold War, you know, which was you know the and drop off era, is because that very easily could have happened, you know, and, um, these, uh, people, uh, I'm sure it sounds cantankerous or it, it comes off like, you know, the obsession of, uh, you know, the revisionist who's got sort of, uh, who's, who's got sort of tunnel vision on a, a discreet epoch or, you know, event, but, uh, you know, people, uh, pe- people have lost sight of how, of how powerful uh the soviet union was and in, in in terms of you know hard power potential and like how uh the world in 1982 to 84 especially was you know it was uh it was uh it was um strategically speaking you know it was uh forces cocked and loaded you know um and the degree of like and the degree of strategic nuclear readiness too like it the uh the uh other than um other than uh abolishing the draft um you know america remained mobilized for war um and uh it people have forgotten what that world was like i mean even even people who lived through it you know um 
So this idea that you know that's 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 one of the reasons that's one of the ways that garbage like 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 fake COVID can be passed off as as a as as like national or global emergencies because they're I mean part of it's um yeah I realize people are malleable and and things but people have always been malleable and not particularly intelligent you know it's it's just that there's not a basis for comparison anymore like so if you don't if you don't have an actual crisis uh, paradigm that's become you know kind of the default normal as was the case during the cold war particularly at critical junctures you know like the andropov era like people people they lose their basis of comparison and it it causes them to take leave of reason Well, no, I'm surprised we, uh, surprised everybody got their, got their questions in. That's, that's encouraging. American populace and shag. <coughs> I'm going to raise up soon because I'm getting sleepy. Yeah, no problem. I'm, uh, making sure we didn't miss. What do we got here? What do we got here? Um, I mean, it's uh, it's a bit on the nose, but Jay Burden was asking, you know, why why do uh, <laughs> why do uh, the communist numbers always never seem to come up compared to uh, other events in history? It seems like that's always the big uh, the big uh, obvious question, but I, I think every I think everybody's uh, got their answer. Um, I mean, you, it's. It, it, that's what the, the historians, the historians debate, you know, Nolte versus Habermas. I mean, I, I write about this a lot. It's not, yeah, the on the nose reason is part of it, but part of it is um, what I'm, it owes to what I'm, what I was discussing with Pete Canones today. The nature of the Nuremberg indictment, it had to be drafted, not just to favor a discrete perspective, obviously, you know, um, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a particular ideological narrative, but it had to present the events in question not just as spontaneous and unprecedented, but as part of a, a sort of self-contained criminal conspiracy of mass homicide that wasn't prompted by anything. It was totally outside the scope of normal statecraft that was not at all related to any sort of greater, broader nexus or constellation of, of causes. Okay. So if that if if that becomes sort of the court narrative, literally and figuratively, um, if you bring up uh, the the communist numbers, so to speak, it's not just a question of uh, of kind of uh, dethroning uh, the competing narrative as as uh, as sort of like you know the most morally shocking and abhorrent uh, occurrence or set of occurrences within historical memory. But it also it also removes the potentiality of of it removes the possibility of this being just considered what I said this like spontaneous homicide conspiracy that was not related to you know uh, historical or apocryphal causes and that changes everything okay um, because it it means that what you're talking about is no longer uh, the victimization of, of of a murdered population by uh owing to owing to the owing to the homicidal designs of maniacs who somehow captured the Everest of state then you're talking about um violence of scale that is really characteristic of the 20th century in a basic way you know and that that, that completely alters the entire basis of the nuremberg system and not just that it totally alters the basis of you know uh why uh of, of the social engineering paradigm that's been underway since 1933 like that's why um it's not um it's not um most people uh like the academics of the, the academics of the left who had who, who had out and out sympathy for stalinism were actually rare like hobsbawm was one and he was an interesting guy I, he wasn't an admirable guy. I don't have nice things to say about him, but he did have some insights. But 
I can't emphasize enough for the reasons I like Kerry Bolton so much. It's not just because he's a he's a guy. He's kind of a man of my own heart, although he's got some weird esoteric interests in, into occultism and things. But his biography of Francis Yaki is fantastic. But his kind of broader project of he's been writing about uh you know the 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 the, uh, the sectarian split within the left. Um, you know, beginning with uh, you know Stalin v Trotsky, and enduring really you know until the end of the Cold War, and even today there's still echoes of that, which in part owe to the hostility to Russia by the you know American Zionist regime. This is fundamentally important, and um, if the reason why in the 80s people like Habermas they it, they refused to really accept. Uh, you know the communist numbers, as it were, not because out of because they wanted to rehabilitate Stalin or like looked at like you know the uh, the Warsaw Pact as anything morally good. You know, in fact, they they probably looked at it as you know a, a basically fascist regime. Okay, I mean not not probably like they did. Okay, but in order to <clears throat> in order to uh, in order to openly discuss the fact that um, again, like I said. This kind of uh, this categorical destruction of, of of human populations, rather than acknowledging that that owed to apocal features of the twentieth century and violence at scale, and you know warfare becoming a becoming truly total, you know, transforming into Weltanschauung Krieg, you know this 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 kind of literally world destroying process. Um, to acknowledge that would be to shatter the entire uh, narrative of anti-fascism, which hinges upon, you know, fascism, as I said, and, and, and various iterations of it um, being, you know, this, this kind of uh, outlier uh, cons criminal conspiracy that that's not related in any way, dialectical or otherwise to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to processes of, of, of mind in, in the epoch from which it emerges. That's why. Let me, okay, you guys are making me tired. I'm sorry to be a gay, but I, um, I, uh, I recorded for, I, rec I recorded with Pete Canones and that was dope. And like, I, I, I caught up on like long form and I'm just, I'm just tired, man. Like at some point, um, I, uh, one, at some t when we can coordinate properly, I realize a lot of this is my fault because weird hours, but we can go live like during the day on a Saturday or Sunday. And um, I'm basically nocturnal, but at night, like I do, like become like more inert. Um, I'll have more energy uh, if we go live sometime during like the mid afternoon or something, you know. And um, because I don't, I don't want people to think that uh, I'm I'm being flippant or something. It's just that uh, when I start getting I mean, part of it's because like it, it hurts my rheumatoid stuff to be sitting up for too long, but also like my my brain kind of starts like not firing that quick, like after a while. So, but that's yeah, just no problem. Old age. Yeah, we'll uh, well we we'll be doing this again sometime. I got to also figure the scheduling a lot a lot better next time because uh, no, no, you're fine, man. I it's it's on me. Like I'm the one who's freaking. Uh, but also too, like, I mean, it was dope that. I could record with Pete today, but it does take something out of me if I record for an hour or two on something like that and then go live because like it's it, it just wears me out, man. But it um no, no, you're you're fine, you're great. Um but no, we'll go we'll go live, uh we'll go live again whenever you want. Not tomorrow, but um but sometime during the week or next weekend. And yeah, if uh if El Nino dips in here, like give him my best. Um oh. Yeah, here I. I'll uh, I'll text him anyway. But yeah, I'm sorry I missed him. But I um, but yeah. No, that, yeah. that was that was my fault. We'll uh, we'll we'll be more organized next time. No, 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 it's not not at all, man. I'm the one you accounted me, man. Last night, I I uh, I'm the one who asked to uh, for to reschedule um, the stream for tonight. So it, you're doing fine, man. I'm the one who's I'm the one who's being old and fucking sleepy. But um, no, I and I really appreciate people participating. That's really great. Um, that's the whole point. So I thank you. Cool people. I appreciate it. But, uh, I'm going to raise up, man. Like I said, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, 
I've got to mine your expertise for, uh, I want to become more active. I'm thinking about starting a Discord channel, man, but also, uh, I, I want to get, um, I want to get more active with original content on YouTube and I need your help with that. I mean, plus, uh, you're part of the team that we have going. So aside from the fact I require expertise, I want you to be a part of it, but yeah, I got to get this manuscript done first but yeah i'll hit you up tomorrow man and like i said i'll get back to regularly scheduled programming on tgram tomorrow um after i eat pancakes and all that so that's right have a happy fourth of july everybody like fly the uh fly the flag <laughs> there we go there yeah. we go good to see you right. man good night hey good to see you thank you thank you again well, don't go anywhere, folks, because we got more people joining, okay? There's a... Uh... Oh, wait a second, Jay Burden, what... Wait a second, man, I thought I thought we just talked via text. What uh... What's going on, big guy? All right, all right, look. Fair point. What Ace is referencing is that I did just say I was too tired to come on, but, you know, you, you sent me the link, and uh, I'll be honest, I couldn't resist. No, that's uh, that's all right. Well, uh, we got some time, of course, and I was trying to get uh, some others in here. I'm waiting for uh, okay, okay. So we got a, a time on that. Let's see, th this is this is the Zoomer work ethic. The Protestants are going to turn their nose up at this, but you know, it, sometimes you you say you're going to do something and then you just fumble, and that is that's what I did. So we're going to try and. We're going to try and make the best of where, where we're at right now. But uh, Jay Burden, while I got you here, I apologize for whoever this was. I don't remember who asked the question, but somebody wanted me to get to you, your thoughts on Resident Evil 4. And we got our expert coming in from, oh, oh. from this the might cartel. Be, uh, this might be sacrilege, but the, uh, the only Resident Evil game I've ever played is Resident Evil 6. And uh, I'll be honest, I like it a lot. It's not good, but I know nothing about the series. So I'm the wrong person to ask. That's a that's a pretty troubling verdict. I, I don't know if I've ever met someone who uh, who got that far down the line because I I actually jumped ship right after that. But I'll put it this way: it's RE6. From what I've heard from people who like Resident Evil, is terrible Resident Evil game, but it's a pretty decent couch co-op shooter so if you're just right. hanging out with a friend and your category for buying games is can i get this for less than five dollars and play it on my xbox it, it meets that pretty well that's right and you know somebody on cozy actually reminded me of this we also have to be honest about the resident evil franchise in general we like to say that resident evil 5 is the beginning of the end i mean there was always that point at the latter half of each game where like you have a rocket launcher at the end, you have this giant gun getting you through the whole game. So I don't think all the blame should be put on RE5, even though I still like it. And even though people say it represents this, uh, you know, this perverted version of the series, but I mean, Resident Evil 4 is also an action game as much as people hype it up. So I just feel like there's not a lot of people being honest about, you know, what we're talking about here. It wasn't always just horror. You know, th those are for the old heads, you know, Zoomers, uh, you know, they like to think they uh, know, know what's best, but. I, I might have a right. controversial opinion here. I think that I don't necessarily think that horror translates well to video games. Oh, th thank mm. you, Minoan, by the way, that I have a super calming voice. I, I, I haven't heard that before, but I'm, that's a nice compliment. Uh, I, I do think that, I don't know, there's something about. I guess like the jankiness of games that at least personally for me kind of pulls me out of horror. And that's not universal. There are some games that have done it well, like uh, the like PT and alien mm. isolation, I think really did wow, it, but man. the majority of them, like I'll never forget it. It was, it was, it was, it wasn't amnesia, but it was a game like that. And one of my friends had it and we were playing it and we were kind of freaked out at first until we realized none of the enemies could hit you if you just spammed the crouch button. So if you just kind of bunny hopped around, you could just break the game. And that's a stupid, just stupid example. But my point is like, at least for me, like 
horror has to be very, very immersive to be horror, to be like actual horror, which is why, I, at least for me, I think movies do it pretty well and books do it pretty well. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's just a personal thing, but I think that games a lot of times tend to be, they can be scary in the sense that it's a jump scare, but not like deep, deeply scary, if that makes sense. No, no, I agree with you. Yeah, the fact that if there's any like work around with the horror then it's it kind of spoils the whole thing yeah if you're not immersed if uh if there's not any uh danger then then you're right oh here we go here we go we're back jose i i apologize we we fumbled with the organization here but it's all good hey man hey man good to, good to see you man. dude uh, we got we got one final person joining us, but I appreciate having you guys on here, especially on a holiday weekend. We uh, it's a great thing to all be here. So I uh, <laughs> to tell you the truth, before Thomas get lost his Twitter account, uh, one of the you know whatever you call it, not really a thread, but just like a mini series of tweets. Uh, I remember he we were going over the Resident Evil lore and Jose jumps in with all of the Ganado quotes that I forgot from my childhood. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we were, I was making some, it does not take place in Franco, Spain. That is not true. But, yeah, yeah. you know, I remember that uh, Thomas was kind of half remembering the plot and it is a very HP Lovecraft inspired game. I kind of overlooked that fact. But uh, I'm going to have to go back and check it all out again because it's been way too long. It's a Zoomer artifact. But RE4 specifically, that's the one that won me over. And got yeah, me I out. barely remember the plot of that too. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was something. And there was all kinds of lore, but it's been so long. Here, I need to – I know that uh, both of you guys got content, and it's it's stuff that I'm, I'm anxious for, so – I want to want to give proper credit here while we got while we got our our Thomas audience out in full force our allied forces over here and then I remember Jose you linked your uh, I think it was your Substack in the last one I wanted to yes because I also I get those emails man and it's it's awesome I uh, recently did an episode with James Edwards of the political cesspool very ah. fun pc episode about race relations immigration and all that good stuff no it's per- perfect segue and then uh oh man J- jay bird and the stuff that you respond to sometimes i have to like not even fully engage with it because it's uh it's enough to give you a lot of bad thoughts but we're uh here I'm oh wait what to- do you mean your your last tweet specifically. I uh... oh no, I, I I use this is not a good quality of mine, but I cannot take Twitter seriously. So no, any no, like I... rancid thought that comes into my brain, it's like, well, I'm subjecting the three people who interact with my tweets to it. No, I it's it's actually quite cruel, but but I, I understand the mindset. It's uh it is a bit of a hodgepodge. <laughs> okay, fair uh, enough. I, I see your point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. I don't even see stuff like that. Like I was in the look. It's a, Rupert Murdoch. I feel like I'm allowed to. I'm allowed to take swings at that guy. No, no, no. It's not the target specifically. It's just I. I just see certain things and it. No, no, I, that's fair. It's very so, hard. To describe. So, Jose, I, one, it's it's nice to meet you. I, I've I've nice. been a fan of your podcast for a while. So, so not to hijack this, but I, I have a question for you. I know you got started in a lot of like two A activism, but what what like organizations did you work with? Yeah, it's actually kind of funny because I got into like politics like 07, like Ron Paul, but I didn't really get um, involved in actual political work like full time until I worked with National Association for Gun Rights and AGR in 2016. And I was in that gig until 2019. That's cool, man. It's it's incidentally like obviously like everyone kind of has their own story for how they ended up here, but there are like of the multiple steps. One of the big ones is uh, I'm sure you remember the big, uh, the Virginia Boogaloo situation. And that whole time yeah. was one of those where I was like, all of a sudden realized very quickly, like, Oh, I don't just dislike these people. I actually hate them. You know? Because, yeah. I mean, I'm sure, you know, right. Like Virginia is a, a very divided state politically. And uh, I realized I did not like the people in charge very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of people, 
generally have those type of moments. I would say one moment that really hardened my views in terms of just like I say I'd say a series of moments that hardened my views towards more of the dissident right was like the more like the Ferguson riots and then the broader refugee crisis of 2015. I think that period was a big transitionary period for me because a lot of people given my background would have just stuck to the libertarian movement and other permutations of like the like cucked right or libertarian spaces. But for me, I think those moments really hardened my views. And I'd say also I had like some kind of pro Buchananite priors before that, that allowed me to make that jump because for other people, it's been a lot more difficult. So, so I'm curious and I'm not asking you to reveal too much, but it's interesting that you said that you're kind of that at least got started with more of like the Ron Paul stuff, because a lot of my, cause I'm in my early twenties, a lot of my like political influences in real life kind of came from that. You know, a lot of people who are kind of in their mid to late thirties now, who were kind of like Ron Paul round yes. one, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, My generation, yeah. like definitely, there's definitely a generational type of divide because for my generation, I was, it was pretty normal for them to be like, quote unquote, Ron Paul babies. But for other people that are younger, I'd say like they would probably go straight to a lot of like DR content and all of that because after Ron Paul retired, a lot of like the libertarian movement splintered. In fact, I'd, I'd venture to say that a lot of the dividing lines you see in broader politics, you see in the libertarian movement too. There's more right libertarians that have, some of it even become like post libertarian too. And I more or less count myself in that fold. And then you have others that have just become like generic globalists and all that. And a lot of movements, a lot of like the, traditional conservative like in libertarian movement you're seeing those type of fissures as well across the board well, well i definitely agree and so it's interesting right like i'm uh, i think coming from that and i think a lot of people on our side of things either went through a libertarian stage or kind of have a lot of that background right yeah and so for me like i would say the reason i ended up here was kind of too odd sections of the right that eventually diverged or that eventually converged the exact opposite of what I said. So on one end, like I, I kind of burnt out at least personally on like the internet skeptic sphere, you know, where it's kind of like, okay guys, like how many times can you dunk on some blue haired feminist sitting in her bedroom? Right. Like that's not super productive. And then on the other end, right. Like, as I'm sure, you know, like there is a lot of like the libertarian sphere that is a little bit like masturbatory. Right. Like it's like, yeah. hey, 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 when we when we do X with the three people that agree with me, you know, then we'll have all this great stuff. And I'm like, OK, guys, you're a bunch of like like you're a bunch of like, you know, lame, unimpressive, overweight, you know, pot addicts. Right. Like, come on, like be, be realistic. But on one end, the skeptic sphere led me to the distributist who's, you know, pretty popular in these on these sides. And then on the other side, Pete Quinones, you know, another guy who's. You know, obviously, been, yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of his. And so eventually those two like lines of thought converged, you know, because there were both things and like, look, like post-libertarian, I'm not going to call myself that, but I have those tendencies, right? Like, it's hard for me to be like, yes, let's get rid of freedom of speech. Like, even if I realize that might have to happen, like it doesn't feel good, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I generally... I'd say I probably gave up a lot of my libertarians, uh, libertarianism before a lot of like the post libertarian movement came in, but I don't really maintain a lot of like the libertarianism with the exception of maybe like foreign policy and my hostility towards central banking. But other like stuff that libertarians like talk about these days for me is like super negotiable and I don't really care that much. I've, I, my political project now is mostly focusing on, uh, destroying multiculturalism and like anti-white hate and all that. Oh, that's, that's, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I was more just talking about like, uh, like my, my personal predilections, right. You yeah. know, like, 
like the part of you that like, or the part of me rather that if this was, if this was 2004, I know I'd be the most obnoxious anti-Bush shit lib in the world, right? Like I'm not going to deny that. It's actually kind of funny. I never really had a shit lib phase. I did have like a neocon type of phase, but um, I mostly like delve, uh, dived into like a lot of like Ron Paul stuff um, through like a funny enough, like a sports forum where there was this like motherfucker always posting stuff about Ron Paul and like the politics section. And then I just like <laughs> looked at like some of the YouTube videos and fell down that rabbit hole like really fast and started reading like lewrockwell.com and then Pat Buchanan and stuff. And yeah, that's how I got kind of red pilled. But a lot of people come into this space through different ways. There's like some people I know that were full fledged like Marxists and all that. And and that doesn't surprise me too, because radical politics, like in radical political movements, people will tend to oscillate from like the far left and far right. And actually there is kind of like a horseshoe of, uh, effect where these types of politics like do attract people from the, like that spectrum. Like if you look at right now in terms of foreign policy, there is a growing rapprochement between like tankies and even like some elements of the far right when it comes to criticizing this faggot imperium that we're under real real okay uh, i'm thinking we're back i'm thinking we're bringing on one of the greatest twitter accounts on the internet sir sir you have the floor to get to get a, it's great honor glad to be uh, with you ace good to see you um been a fan of Jose Nino for a bit and uh, recently been also getting into some of Jay Burden's uh, interviews. It's all very good. It's good to hang out with you guys. Nah, man. This is this is our Doom Patrol. You know, I know James Lindsay is back on the timeline, but this is our, you know, our own little version of that. So it's good to be in good <laughs> company. Uh, appreciate all you guys. Yeah. Did it, by the way, look, can we talk about that? Did anybody see that? What's going on? Um, so James Lindsay, he's been... Uh, I don't know. I guess this is like old war now, but about a year ago he was, uh, or was, was that like a couple months ago that he started? No, it was a year ago because uh, like, so I, Man. I actually like kept up with his podcast for a while because it was kind of helpful as like a primer on like a lot of like the Frankfurt school stuff and not having like been exposed to that. It was helpful, but he just got more and more and more irritating over time. And the thing that, and I have him muted on Twitter, which is why I definitely did not see this because he, he triggers me and it's, he, I don't understand it. it. I cannot get in his mentality where he has so much reading on like on the, the enemy, whatever you want to call it. But his, right. his only answer is to go back to 1994 and he can't wrap his head around the fact that he has just become like a caricature of like a return to the fifties conservative. And that would be bad enough, but he, he's a belligerent midwit and he starts fights with people that agree with him for no reason, for absolutely no reason. So he was kind of antagonizing people on our side of things. Like he, he started a fight with Alex Crusciuto for no reason yep. again, for no reason. And his big point is like, Oh, you guys are just LARPing as traditionalists. Like, you're not really traditionalist. And I'm like, S says who? You know, like, I'm, I don't literally think that I'm, you know, living in the 1920s. But is it this hard to believe that people have different ideas? And it's just the, like, the absolute peak of, like, both the, the like, obnoxious and title centrist and, like, just absolute moron midwit. And that's why I have him muted on Twitter. No, I think uh, some Orthodox Christian account put it best. He uh, he basically responded to James Lindsay's like last tweet and said, "This is what no metaphysics does to an MFer," which really <laughs> just, that really you know it's it's funny because like I disagree with a lot of the Orthodox guys, but it's just like, man, could you please just like you said, you know, just work with a little bit of the research that's right in front of you? But it looks like we're not going to get over that hurdle. Uh, Garak, thank you for sharing me this. Uh, very yeah, I, I, I threw up a tweet you reminded me of. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Let me click on one of my 100 tabs. Hopefully I click the right one. There we yeah, go. Yeah, I've never really followed that Lindsay guy, but from 
what I'm hearing now, it's it seems like a similar script of like these centrists always trying to play the role, the futile role of the Girondin against the Jacobins, mm. and they just get slaughtered every time because they're just so feckless and useless against this like torrential wave of like destructive leftism. And yeah, I, I always have noticed this in like my time, like in politics of like these people that just like pop up every now and then that try to control the discourse and like tone police people and do absolutely nothing to contain the left. Well, and I'm, I'm especially offended by it because he kind of suckered me in on the front end. Like he actually, at least personally, provided a lot of information I found useful about, you know, kind of the new left and uh, like the Frankfurt School because I just wasn't exposed to that otherwise. So it was a helpful like these are the yeah that's actually pretty creative on his part like to like use that because a lot of these people like the Barry Weiss like centrists and all these types they just like don't even have anything like unique to offer. At least this guy tries like real you in with Douglas, Douglas Murray. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. His, new, his new book's out. I was sort of ranting to a friend at the bookstore the other day about his whole episode with Pedro Gonzalez. And it's very illustrative of how people of that sort of liberal centrist sort of Bill Maher mindset are completely unable to distinguish between friend and enemy. And Lindsay is a very good example. Well, and it's especially annoying because he he's like in the, the classic position of always getting to everything five years late. Like he he leaned into the MAGA stuff, but in like 2021. So <laughs> dude, okay, like wow, you've got a MAGA. Like, cool, I guess. And look, like I'm not yeah. I'm not like anti-Trump or anything, but like I don't know, man. Like the, the time's kind of passed. It's not even like Reagan Bush '84, like retro cool. You just like <laughs> you know what I mean? it's just kind of embarrassing at this point. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's what is it like 2011 Fox News? It's like yeah, it's uh, yeah. I guess that was okay, but the, like you said, yeah, not even. Not... I think I think you're selling you're selling Fox News a bit, a bit short. It could get pretty racy. <laughs> no, that is true. As, that is as true. As Nightmare Vision was reminding us. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, me and Garak were uh, we're tuning into some good content with Nightmare Vision. That's uh, I think I think yeah, I love like Nightmare Vision, man. <laughs> it's just it's the oh, perfect best, thing at the best perfect. Twitter account ever, maybe. Yes, uh, no, he's I, one of the best, man. <laughs> I we tried to reach out to him to uh, have him speak for us, but uh, our account got deleted, so that was unfortunate. But he, he seemed pretty receptive. He was just going to give uh, you know basically a shit post of a speech, which is better than nothing. Honestly, it's it's more educational than the stuff we get on campus so any any audience wait, wait, that can Night- nightmare vision nightmare vision doing a campus tour <laughs> well not a, not a campus wait, tour wait. i mean we weren't really thinking it all the way through we just wanted like to expose like him to as many people as we could just because we thought the content was so good but uh <laughs> but yeah maybe we get a you know allied forces world tour nightmare vision owls across the nation I don't know. Maybe we, you know, it gets a cult going with the young kids. It's the new SDS. Mm. I'm imagining uh, Ble- Blepe, um wearing a Hitler <laughs> Hitler European Tour T-shirt from the '80s, <laughs> slinging it some California. That's right. We're, yeah, we're gonna get the Motorhead fashion uh, back in circulation. That's with what I'm wearing the, right now. The tanks. You got the Motorhead shirt. You got the I screwdriver got the shirt on. There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, gotta, I have yet to acquire. I've yet to acquire the Eden Stewart uh, adults. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, you'll, you'll have to reach out to Thomas for that one. I'm sure he's got. I, f- I actually found I found the place where he buys his uh, shirts. Actually, oh, is that right? Is, is it true? Because Lemmy said it's like mostly in America. Is that true? I found fa- I found a website which lists a lot of the stuff that I've seen him wear. So, mm. not not to suck all the air out of the room with this uh, sort of metal fashion detour, but. <laughs> <laughs> Chat. Hey, Charlemagne. Thank you for stopping. <laughs> your comments in the chat thank thank you i appreciate it uh agreed endorsed uh but yeah elon bust yeah that's the the lethal combination of a current current american citizen yeah i was telling my dad the other day it's like yeah there's this guy he just he just pretends to be morrissey i can't really describe it beyond that but it's uh you know there's plenty of uh characters on the on twitter for sure but uh, dude, my favorite account used to be used to be Charlemagne. This guy would just go in there, guns blazing, no regrets, and got fr- freaking destroyed by uh, you know just for using one wrong word. It's it's very I, saddening. I hate to say it, but I'm 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 honestly I'm surprised it took 
as long for him to get banned. I, it did. I know. Because there, there know. were some things where I was, uh, <laughs> I was surprised those stayed up there for as long as they did, right? Because I lost yeah. an account. Like I, I'm on my third Twitter account, not not connected to my channel, just from you know, kind of shit posting. And I lost my first two so fast, like so <laughs> incredibly fast. Uh, one of them, which I, do you, remember, you know uh, that guy Carlos Maza, gay woman oh, on Twitter. Oh. <laughs> That's our favorite Hispanic on Twitter, yes, yeah, by all means. The nasty ass Latinx guy. It's just right. it's so easy. You know, it's like my, it's like Michael Jordan playing wheelchair basketball. It's like I, I, <laughs> everything he says, it's like you said it. You know, I'm just repeating back the words you used to describe yourself. And apparently that's offensive. No, no. I, I think he even doesn't he voice he does the Vox narrations, doesn't he? Or now this? He, I remember I was that's just, his background, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe he I quit mean, or something. He, he got too edgy. That's what he's been doing the last couple of weeks. He's just been fed posting about the Supreme Court, which oh, <laughs> not yeah, to man. not to play the whole double, not to play the double standards game, but it is kind of obnoxious. Uh well, yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, very fitting well, for sure. Well, it's this really irritating thing, and I know what you mean because the whole dialogue of it, the left, the left has no standards, isn't particularly productive, right? Like obviously, it's 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 not hypocrisy, it's hierarchy, right? But mm. that said, there is something incredibly irritating. It's like it's like the teacher's pet in school, you know, exactly. who like push you and push you and push you and push you and just say the most like in, you know, like deliberately ins insightful things, not insightful, inciting things. And then yeah. the moment you react, it's like the hammer of God, right? You just get banned like from orbit, you know. And it's like this. This is such an yeah, unfair yeah. situation. And no, I've gotten a little better at not reacting, but every once in a while, I just like. What? I, I got to step away. Like, it, it, I just want to say something that's like right there. But you can't. No, it's it's really strange that whole crowd. I mean, like, Right Wing Watch was the first my introduction to those those types of people. Like, I didn't realize there was literally an industry of people that just hate watches right wing content. And well, it's like the Trump, the Trump reply guys are another example of phenomenal. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's true too. It's just so weird. It's such a strange little, you know. Strange little group of people, but uh, and I, I can't tell what's bait. Like you said, I can't tell what's bait anymore. I just I can't even, like you said, can't take anything serious because it's so uh, overlapping with everything. But uh, yo, here we go. <laughs> um, uh, yo, America Populous, I, I I saw you earlier. If you wanna if you wanna jump in, if we could uh, get as many people on this as possible, uh, we that was a very good stream. No, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, he's coming on my channel tomorrow. I think we're gonna do a Fourth of July stream at nine PM. So that should be no, that's, fun. That's perfect, man. No, I that's can't dope. wait. You guys, uh, yeah, you specifically, Jay Burton, you've been bringing a lot of uh, consistent guests. Uh, so that's well, uh, well, that's good because I, I had the most dog shit interview possible on Thursday, and it was not my guest's fault at all. I, I just showed up and and dropped the ball every conceivable way. So uh, I, I'm gonna take that as a as a compliment, but a very qualified one, right? Um, oh, David the Gnome. That's uh, that's Jay Burden. That is Jay White Man's Burden. Let me get the uh, <laughs> let me get the link in here real quick. Um, so Robert bro. Robert Penn Warren reference. It takes a very high IQ to understand. Ah, yes. There we go. Vingle. Oh, uh, dude, Vingle's still here, dude. I was thinking about you, guy, in the theater. I I haven't read your comment yet, but you you know what I'm talking about. This guy. This guy knows. Okay, I'm thinking we're back. I'm thinking we're bringing. <laughs> How do we even organize this? Hold on. How do you? What is the most? Uh... <laughs> oh no no no! I don't know what you do when you have this many guests. Uh, hey, well, American Populous, welcome. Your first time on the show. Congrats. No, yeah, I saw you guys were just hanging out. I wanted to hop in. Uh, so Jay hopped in. You know, my favorite. Uh, guy on our sphere <laughs> there you go there well, you well go. thanks man also i want to formally apologize for being so awful at replying to your dms i don't i like i forget twitter has dms and so i'll like read your read something you send me and then react four days later and i just feel like an ass so i'm a little sorry about that one dude but uh it's it's not personal at all it's my own boomer tech stuff no no it's it's fine man. I, don't, I don't care <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Vingo. Yeah. You get it. You get it. Hey, man. If they're if they're showing that in the movie, how can I not endorse? It's it's too much, man. 
But uh, but thank you, thank you. You you were part of the experience. You and Oscar Toe, hard to describe. But uh, no, we love Vingle. We love Vingle. Where's your hype man at? Your hype man used to be in the chat, and I don't know. Are you going solo now? I don't know what's going on here, but I mean, maybe that's old lore. But uh, it's good to have you in here, nevertheless. Uh, no, Edward. Okay, can we keep the optics in the chat? No, it was not. It's not what I'm referring to. It was a, uh, was a safe. This was a safe environment, so uh, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the left. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here, I'm just catching up with every upright, upright. Yes, uh. <laughs> All right. All righty. This is what happens when you just when you just give the link out. I remember with Oros, we put the link in the chat. It's dangerous stuff. Probably shouldn't do that. It's probably putting everybody at risk. But you know what? Nevertheless, we we do what we can over here. We're, uh, I think my hype man got a GF and just went offline. Many such cases. These people, man. You pay someone to hype you up on Twitter, and uh, all of a sudden they're getting like goth GFs on the side. This is this is not this does not represent all of us, unfortunately. Humor, no. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Lane. I'm glad to uh, pass the torch on to you. <laughs> uh, man, Garak, I was going to ask you about something, but my mind's blanking. I know you've been going wild on the on the Buchanan Nixon books. So yeah, I was rereading his. Some um, the that pet the, the most recent Pat Buchanan book, uh, his memoir about working with Nixon, Nixon's White House Wars. It's probably my favorite book of his. It's quite touching. I just wanted to go back into it to sort of get back into that sixties, seventies headspace. And um, yeah, I, all I have to say is highly recommend. I think you in particular, you you'd love it, Ace, because you, you love Nixon, you love the Paleocons. It, no, I'm surprised you haven't read it. It's a know, it's a very good book. Yeah, I wanted and, uh, to go through here. I, I, so have prevailing a, I have theory a Nixon behind... flex. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> I was just saying the book is sort of meant as a warning to the Trump administration. And is it? Proof, I, prophetic. Kind of. You'll, you'll, you'll have to read it to see, but yeah, yeah, what were you yeah, saying? Yeah. Oh, so I, I have a Nixon flex, which uh, I found at an antique store in the middle of nowhere, small town Virginia. I found an original Nixon Now bumper sticker for $4. <laughs> So I bought that instantly, and I, that's a treasured possession of mine now. There you go. That's great, man. I, I have his memoirs from a secondhand bookshop in like some Australian country town. I have no idea how it ended up there. Incredible. But that so, is always I do right, love right like there on the shelf. I, I do love those kind of like book stories, right? So I bought a copy of I can't remember what it was. It was some book, but uh, oh, it was uh, it was the Sound and the Fury. And it had a, a sticker on the inside front cover that said Houston Public Library and a business card from a, a 70s Houston insurance agent as a bookmark somewhere in there. And I have no idea how that ended up like halfway across the country, but I do kind of like, I don't know, I like <laughs> at least thinking about it, right? Oh, uh, cool. I'm so imagining some Tom Wolf kind of guy traversing uh, Dixie. <laughs> yeah, wow. exactly. That could have been it. Um, yeah, uh, whoever was asking, I don't know what happened to the super chats. Um, it, it seems to have happened ever since uh, I got the warning for the uh, election statement that was set on stream. Uh, we'll, I, I just figured out how to get that, that window video back up. I don't know. We'll probably put that on Odyssey or something, but for super chats, I'm not sure. We'll, uh, I'll try to see what we can do there, but uh, I don't know what happened to tell you the truth. I don't know how that got switched. Because it seems like it's not there anymore. But uh, but uh, thank you for reminding me because I forgot about that. Um, what do we got? <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, let let me find uh, one second. We're uh, going off the cuff here for a second. Well, American Populous, I wanted you to kind of uh, to uh, give yourself a little bio here because you just recently came on my radar thanks to uh, Jay Burden. So I just wanted to give you the floor here. Let me find your uh, your your content. Uh, it's it's the same name as my YouTube name. I use the same names for everything just to make it more. No, 
But if you don't know me, I kind of come more, my background is from the provincialist kind of sphere. I originally became a patriot of his um, on the show, though. That was a pretty bad interview on the first time, but that's kind of how I officially got part of this. I've been a part of it unofficially for a very long time. Um, I, I attribute it most to my background because I was raised as a Baptist. And later, my grandfather revitalized some of my more uh, Southern culture, you know, Southern elements, which I greatly appreciate him for carrying on that tradition, which he passed down to me which he passed down from his father as well. So that's kind of my background in the synopsis. Um, gotcha, gotcha. I have, so I'm not personally a Baptist myself, but I did, my grandparents are kind of the very stereotypical, like midlife convert, you know, mega church, Baptist, you know, neocon types, right? It's a lot of adjectives, but if you know the type of person, I think you understand. But, uh, no, that's very accurate for most Baptist churches in the South. But yeah, no, I have a lot of I have a lot of affection for that like type of person. I don't know. It's it's a it's a it's it's kind of a it's a common character in our neck of the woods. A, a right? southern a southern twist on the boomer con, I, I would imagine. Oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> exactly. That's Just that's that, what I get from like, the horror stories my Georgia friend uh, tells me. <laughs> <laughs> I like I grew up like all the all of the like shit lib propaganda you hear about like jesus camp and talk radio that's what i grew up on like i went to jesus camp and it was a military themed <laughs> jesus camp so they literally prepped us to to to, <laughs> to fight for george bush <laughs> which is a while now that i say it but uh it was a good time is that right i, I didn't really get that i was more of the uh kind of just peace kind of crowd of the baptist church it kind of anti-war more patriotic kind of sphere and it varies a lot in the Baptists, obviously, because they're very independent a denomination. But I'm not personally a Baptist anymore, but I attribute that to my culture, of where I come from. Because I originally come from Florida, I'm a native Floridian, you know, a very rare breed because everybody is now yeah. flooding into the state and ruining it with all their garbage subdivisions, tearing down the oak trees that have been there for hundreds of years. But... <laughs> No, I can imagine. Is that the new Texas now? Is that uh, what we're going to be hearing about because of uh, some new neighbors? Not, not until they so. get constitutional carry. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. I, I feel like uh, I feel like Florida has because I'm a I'm a great like like I consider myself a scholar of the BoomerCon, and, and Florida has its own variety, right? Like it, it's a distinct flavor, you know. Like it's the it's the either the like native floridian who's just so tanned they're like leather you know or you've got the like the awful like connecticut snowbird you know <laughs> it's just its own <laughs> like variety of plague no that's very accurate all those people also have a fake tan they go to the beach in, like daytona and when there's other beaches where they all like to go and the snowbirds own their second homes and one of these popping up suburbs which are just uh, ruining the landscape but that's my rant for the suburbanites. We're all moving. Or, or even worse, the like four hundred and fifty thousand dollar like eighty foot long RV. You know that they just drive <laughs> while just like you know, <laughs> listening to to Rush Limbaugh reruns and drinking out of a big gulp. That's America. That's very true. But my grandfather was more of an Airstream guy, so we had some taste at least in his RVs. I will give him that. He was a more classic kind of guy. So, so like I said, I, I do love. Like just personally, I love the Boomer Con, but one of the the newest uh, the newest innovations, as I was kind of making a joke about it, but uh, the Rush Limbaugh show still airs, and they have a host who will introduce segments of Rush Limbaugh that they have cut together <laughs> to match the current news of the day. So they've just like reanimated this man's corpse and are just like cutting up his his entire body of work to keep up the production line. Right, oh, it's like the God. Disney CGI recreation. Yeah, you're, you're like one step away from a hologram. <laughs> well, right, like there it reminds know. me of that really creepy article that came out a few days ago about Amazon Alexa speaking with the voice of your dead relatives, right? Where they were like, "Oh, you oh, can upload oh. audio clips of Grandma," you know, so she could talk to you about your day. And of course, the first thing I thought was, "Well, whose voice could we put into Amazon Alexa?" And then, I mean, I don't know. Like, I think it would be really funny to have Adolf Hitler read me my grocery list every day. <laughs> it would be, uh, it would be memorable for sure. You wouldn't 
forget anything. So uh, you wouldn't forget about the juice. Might... You would. You would. You would. You would. <laughs> the jokes write themselves. It's too easy. Um, I wanted to share uh, something. I think I saw. I don't know if it was this morning. I don't know how many hours ago this was, but uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that really motivates me throughout the day. Of course, just another another cat classic you guys are familiar with from our guy over here. But, uh, you know, we were talking about earlier, it's just sort of this, these people that are stuck in quicksand, politically speaking. And uh, I just think this goes back to our uh, James Lindsay discussion of, uh, you know, the kind of philosophy we're really tangling with here. Uh, J you know, Peter Singer is someone who we were actually talking about in, uh, at our university in, uh, over in uh, Southern California. But uh, Jason Stanley is someone who's kind of, in the back of my mind always i'm just kind of curious how that guy gets through the day you know what's motivating him but it's just it's an interesting cast and crew that's uh that's for sure i i asked that question i saw i saw bill crystal on my timeline saying that you know july 4th is inherently an anti-maga holiday and then oh, right. this giant dry tribe but what i don't understand is how do you wake up in the morning as bill crystal and be like, you know what? You know what the world needs more of? My opinions. Really? You know, like, how could you be more wrong than that guy? Semitic, and have Semitic the confidence to still get up every morning and be like, yep, I'm going to do it again. I think he's just coping for being so short. I mean, like, he wakes up every day and he's four it's from true. 11. So it's probably just a massive cope for how short yeah. he is. I mean, I think it was either you or one of the others who brought up how short he was, which I didn't even know, but it well, makes I, sense. I have to... Wait a second. Yeah, I, I bet I could. I bet He's I could like toss a Bill Crystal. Like I, I bet I could. I could throw him pretty far. And I, oh I yeah, like you said you could try. wrestle him. I would love to see that. No, it's <laughs> not Bill Crystal who's that small. It's it's another one. Is it? It might be Kissinger. Oh. Wait, he is that small? Yeah, Kissinger is very Yeah. The Wikipedia page says he's 5'9", too. That is not 5'9". <laughs> That's Tinder 5'9". Like, <laughs> bro, he has soles in his shoes. Yeah, it's like, over. Through debating these people, these people <laughs> who shoved into lockers, like, end of the story. Yeah, too t too short to debate. You have better opinions when you grow. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't bully people. It's over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is what happens. Oh no! Oh no! Bullying. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal logging. It's it's over, Cotton Bros. Oh well, yeah. Speaking of very tall. characteristics, I found it funny earlier this week when Pootler. Um, basically told Western <laughs> leaders to post physique after <laughs> freaking Boris Johnson was at this like NATO summit with a bunch of other uh, Western uh, leaders saying like, oh, shall we take our clothes off so that we can take a picture to show Putin that we're, we're tough because they were trying to like do like a mockery of like Putin's shirtless horseback uh, images and all that stuff. It's just like, man. No, it's... Dude, how can anyone make fun of those pictures? It's literally like he's posting his W's live. And people are and then, like, like Putin, Putin responded saying like, you can't. Like, he said something to the effect of like in response to those comments that Johnson made that like you guys are like look like nasty as fuck and you guys should not be like <laughs> posing uh, at all in front of the camera. Yeah, Dude. I think he said, do you guys even lift at all? <laughs> you yeah, he was like, oh, to they go to the gym, which was so base. The physiognomy posting is so real. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like, like it is. Yeah, I feel like it is the, like, the, the like, oh, the crystallized version of bio-Leninism, right? Yeah. Like, there's a reason yeah. that, like, I'll, look, all I'm saying is there's a reason that no one at the Roe v. Wade protest is hot, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, post-physique needs to be, like, the standard for, like, politics like really like that's like a litmus test is this real <laughs> is this a real photograph can we uh can we get some fact checkers there's like <laughs> i remember i remember i remember there were a lot, there was a lot of resist live sort of uh posting about it way back when when putin's uh shirtless pics were just dropping <laughs> the funny part about that gato summit was like Boris Johnson looked disheveled, like as always, like That's, dude is like in a perpetual state right, yeah. of drunk people. Yeah, which is like even funnier. Yeah, didn't none of them had ties, right? Is that the one? Is that the picture? Ah, hold on a second. It was funny because Boris also said like Putin wouldn't have invaded Ukraine if he was a woman. Which is <laughs> yeah. The most like yeah, yeah. thing I've ever heard from a man. It's just this. <laughs> and then Putin Putin's response is to bring up uh, Thatcher and the Falklands. 
Right, right. That's right. I saw you were retweeting that one, Garak. The, uh, that, that's actually a take that's crystallizing a lot in like um, international relations circles about how if you just have wi a, a women leader, you wouldn't have like geopolitical conflicts. It's like, dude, have you guys read like Aristophanes' Assembly Women? Like, you, that's what you get when you get like femoid <laughs> occupied government. I, I, I remember Razor Fist's uh, jive. He goes, You know, you wouldn't have war. You would have one economy crashing into the rear end of another one. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's funny, too, because it's like, have you ever you ever been to middle school? Like, no, yeah. that, that's not how it yeah. works. It's, it's, not a, it's not like obviously peaceful, right? Stupid. Wait, yeah. Ace. If you if you can pull this up, look up the uh, look up the Belgian health minister. If you want to get a real oh, uh, no, oh, no, 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 oh, no. Oh, 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 what kind of physiognomy are you doing with? Ah, <laughs> oh, you, <know, laughs> you don't want to know. Uh, she's uh, she's pretty good, man. I don't I don't what? know why you guys are counter signaling. Uh, on, a on a hut scale. <laughs> okay, I'm thinking we're back. <laughs> Hold on a second. I okay. think she's what's referred to as a Texas nine. <laughs> hold on a second here hold on guys wait a second surely this can't be that bad sister chad <laughs> folks to, to, to go back to uh, what thomas was saying that looks like it looks like a female version of the baron harkonnen from dune right <laughs> no it's uh I'd like to imagine the kid that she'd have with uh, Steve Bannon. Uh, honestly, honestly, though, would under under different circumstances, we're we're gonna have to uh, measure that out later on. But <laughs> yeah, what that, what different uh, circumstances? The global South. I'm just saying we're you know we're, we're gonna have to not jump to conclusions is what I'm saying. You know what I mean? I mean, surely, surely we can get like a a younger photograph. What is this, Maggie the Block? The block. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's let's listen. Let's not be. Let's be. Uh, let's play fair here. <laughs> All right, hold on. She wasn't born. She was spawned. She she just appeared <laughs> looking like that. Oh no no no! <laughs> <laughs> Right. Like somebody from the, like my 600 pound life like somebody on that show she, she looks like a background character from wally list up she eats you entirely no mercy all your <laughs> hp uh fires several balls out of the fat okay 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 all wait right. wait I, i've got a i've got a story to tell you guys so uh so my dad worked in uh, and i won't i won't get too specific but he worked in operating rooms all across the south right not as a doctor but just had a job that he was in there and so if you know anything about the south uh we have a lot of we have a lot of big people and so he would see a lot of you know larger patients and the, the worst thing he ever told me and this is including like horror stories of you know like motorcycle accidents and all of it was that they were bringing in a person for a cat scan and they were they couldn't physically get up so they basically they have like a like a like a, a pulley that they use to get you out of bed, and when they like lift them up by their arms with the pulley, everything kind of shifts around. And when they pulled this woman out, a, a full subway foot long in a, in the in the bag fell out. It had fallen in between her rolls, and it got dislodged by them moving her, and it, it just. It would been fully submerged in her, and that was the moment where I was like, "All of the, all of the all the fat people just in the oven. Like it's, we got to get rid of them because that's too much." That's uh, I can't yeah. think of anything more traumatizing than that <laughs> than witnessing that in real life. Yeah, that that will solve third world starvation by just sending all those people and their fat that's, rolls. I was about to say, like that's that's like. I know that we're kind of past the whole whale oil thing, but I think we need to go back to it as a source of biofuel, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, there was a brief period back in 2017, 2018, where a lot of just, you know, the anti-SGW crowd moved on to just making fun of fat people. I remember that for a time. They just made fun of fat people, <laughs> fat women specifically with colored hair. If you remember that. Should be obese people should be arrested. <laughs> yeah. Arrested on site. There was a bit of a comeback with that sort of 
<laughs> around the whole vaccine mandate discourse, a lot of the more boomer posters like um, I remember Trump Jr. doing this thing that you should mandate like physical fitness. Yes. In response to the vax thing. Oh man. Sorry, a little distracted. A little. <laughs> oh no no. By the way, the most gayest thing I saw today, I found out, was that the the, the prime minister, it's the president of Finland, this woman, you know, of course, this, all right, uh, bio project, was marching in a gay pride parade to celebrate Finland joining NATO. It's just wasn't she the isn't she the key one? <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's actually not that bad looking. Yeah. Really, really, Pratt was uh, being very honest on the timeline about her. Yeah, it's. Uh... No comment. No comment. I thought I, there was a weird crossover where it was like she came out and there were a bunch of like photos of her in like cat ears or whatever. I can't remember. Or maybe as a member of parliament or something like that happened. Pause. And it was right at the moment that Moldbug announced he was dating that like weird BDSM <laughs> woman. And there's part of it was like, is, is Moldbug yeah. dating the prime minister of Finland? Because uh, maybe that's a better move than we thought. But it was like the weird crossover of like horse girl in leather you know oh wait a second i know what photo you're talking about hold on a second. she she likes to edit pictures of herself as a cat and post them on finnish uh, 4chan mm. from what i hear they have a big image board culture there is that like do you remember that one uh that one girl who worked in uh, russia uh they would make anime edits of her you know what i'm talking about Oh yeah, the uh, Crimean uh, prosecutor. Um, That's right. Yeah. I oh yeah, I do remember that. I'm embarrassed that I remember that. Yeah. Was that back in 2014 era? Uh, I remember a lot of stuff. Someone made a political. Day, I remember. Someone made a political compass out of all of them. So it's like the authoritarian left was Kim Jong Un's sister. Of course. Authoritarian right was the Crimean lady. Live left was the uh, AOC. <laughs> oh man. Live right, Abby, Abby Shapiro. A lot of people on dissident Twitter are just down bad. I think we have to reckon with that. <laughs> no, I think that's I think that's what we have to take into account. Well, well Oro's post has really been dropping the hammer on Twitter on uh, on dr horny posting. Is you that know, right? where it's like stop it's... talking about the ideal trad wife. You haven't been on a date and you're 34 years old. You know, like yeah, I don't know, bro. Let's get to step one. <laughs> yeah, I think we're gonna have to uh, taking a step at a time here. Now Oros is uh, he's pretty strict in the Discord, so I, I come you know I respect that. So sometimes someone's got to lay down the hammer. Yeah, especially because I think we all not we all, but at least some people <laughs> nuked Prudentialist's Telegram because <laughs> the conversation. Oh, I remember that. That was, that was such stupid. a base. Yeah, when I, yeah, listen, man. Everybody in that chat was on their best behavior. I don't understand what could have possibly caused. Uh, the server to get nuked. That's pretty unfortunate. I love the base discussions and calls we had in there. If you were there for it, you remember what I'm talking about because I was part of them. But <laughs> well, there's just like something about like having something like Telegram or Twitter, where the the delay between brain and mouth is almost nothing. Where you just like you get worked <laughs> up and you find yourself and you're like, why did I say that? That's the stupidest <laughs> thing I've ever said. But it's I don't know. I was making a point, right? And Okay, the the chat cannot endorse everything in the chat, but uh, <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> all right, we're gonna we're gonna have to uh, switch here. We're gonna have to uh, Charlie yeah. now. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Okay, let's let's move on to something uh, more controversial, just to uh, escape that one. I want to take it back to Jason Stanley. Well, actually, I don't know if we're going to be, I don't know if this is good for YouTube. You know what? Let's not, let's not do that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to share it. I appreciate it, Garak, but uh, I don't know if I can share that one. Uh, it's, we're all in the know here. So I don't think that's, I, I think we all basically agree with that one. Um, yeah, we'll see. Something I did want to mention real quick was a couple days ago, the city of Tucson, which just shows you how gay it is, was like, we're not going to celebrate the 4th of July. We're going to say, oh, fuck the 4th, you know, to own the conservatives for overturning Roe v. Wade. I'm just like, ah. we need to just <laughs> give you back to Mexico because you're just such a... <laughs> well, I mean, it basically is Mexico from what I hear. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Lawn mode because of mass migration. So yeah, they're North, like... North Tijuana, um, South Phoenix has been taken over. Pretty much. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's a shame because that really was the only thing keeping me from moving there. You know, it's like, oh, well, they're going to have their fourth celebration. You know, I was 
but now that they're that now that they're not having that it's like well you have all the other great things about tucson like uh okay fair enough there's not too much good going on in tucson right (laughs) (laughs) it's rough it's rough well jose i figure this is something this is sort of in your wheelhouse arizona i've always heard has had very good sort of very libertarian gun laws maybe that's a cool factor yeah, it actually, um, when Arizona passed constitutional carry in 2010, that was a watershed moment for the constitutional carry movement because it was like literally like a really fringe movement before then because it was only Alaska and Vermont that had permitless carry. And then when Arizona passed in 2010, a lot of states followed. Yeah, it's like, uh, but a lot of that stuff will be totally eviscerated if the GOP doesn't get its act together and get Mm. like an immigration moratorium in because the whole Southwest and a lot of other Sunbelt states are just going to get transformed and you'll have the whole elect the new people dynamic in play, Mm. which will, will end (laughs) the historic American nation. So those guys need to wake up. Hey, uh, can I, can I ask you a, this is kind of a dumb question, but if you, uh, being like from that area, have you ever interacted with uh, with Carl Casada? No, no. He's a uh, he's like kind of an infamous lol cow. He was uh, he used to do he used to have some show with the Forgotten Weapons guy, but it kind of it got leaked that he was like a a tranny dating Satanist. And he goes on. You can still find him on Twitter. He's at In Range TV. Everyone should go bully him. Oh yeah, but yeah, yeah. He he's says sort of the most calls, yeah. wild stuff. And it, it's, it's honestly kind of funny because he, he continually will like set up situations f- for people to make him angry and then spurg out for days on end. So, uh, but, I, but the point is I, he's in Arizona and was a big, uh, big, he's really mad at whatever's going on in Arizona continually. Yeah. I'm not from that area, but I, I just know about like the gun policy there from like hours of reading up on gun policy in my previous employment, but yeah, pretty wild stuff. Um, what did I pull up here? I wanted to ask, I know that this is basically old news at this point, but just while, while I got you guys here, I, again, there's, this is kind of like a college course class, but I, you know, I'm just curious, you know, I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on this just cause I mean, I don't even have to pull it up for longer than a second, but well, what's sort of our our, our first takeaway from uh, from this video? Uh, I'm sure uh, a lot to unpack here. Right, right. Because right. first of all, it's not real, right? That's kind of the the first thing to get out of the way, or or is there anyone disputing that? She looks like the guy from Trailer. Is that a man or a woman? Well, this is a man right here. Okay, I haven't watched this video, but uh, okay. the the guy kind of looks like. Oh, what's that character from Office Space? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Oh, um, point being, she looks like he looks like some kind of like like '90s comedy I character. I forgot that guy's name. But anyways, um, I don't think this is real. But I think you know that doesn't really matter. Of course, the the dialogue is kind of uh, is a kind of statement of its own. But uh, but Garak, would you like to uh, to start off here just because? I don't know. I had a bunch of I had a bunch of different thoughts while watching this, but I uh, I want someone more optical to kind of uh, lay the groundwork. Am I more optical? <laughs> I take that as a compliment. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I have any unique take on it. It's just kind of that shit. What I will say is, from a sort of foreigner's perspective, I can't really imagine that sort of stuff happening outside of the left coast of America. Right. It's sort of in a weird way, the country is sort of like one of the more base countries in the West. In certain areas, yet some parts are definitely worse than even sort of like because like, I don't think you see that in another country, right? No, that's that's for sure. And I just I have a hard time imagining this actually happening, even in you know I, I just obviously this is like bound to happen in in what? other cities. I mean, you're sort of it, in the belly of the beast, kind of. I imagine, sort of. Yeah, and I I don't really see it, you know. And you know, maybe I'm I'm a bad example, but. I just I don't really see even Cal- by California standards this really turning into a problem. I want it to happen because it is funny and again it's the, <laughs> it's the left it's you know it's like the 60s boomer confronting their uh, progressive you know offspring. It's that whole dynamic unfolding but I'm just I don't know. I I find it really just I don't know. I guess from a comedic point of view 
Um, you know, this is the kind of chaos where no one's really getting hurt. It's just, you know, ideology is being disproven in real time. But uh, I don't know. I, I just can't get over the fact that it's not real. That's the, the biggest tragedy to me because I just, I just can't, I can't picture it even in California. So I don't know. I, that I would, don't know. Again, like I'm going to be honest, I haven't watched the video, so I'm the worst source possible for this, but from what I've just like seeing it with no volume, like I, I have seen interactions like that, at least when it comes to like blue cities and red States, you know, and specifically like, so I, I, I went to school in a small college town in a very, very red area, but because it was a college town and kind of an old hippie enclave, it was this weird mix of like, you know, like, like old, like hippies who still kind of get acid flashbacks. And then like, you know, SSRI addled TikTok zoomers. And so like, I never saw something that bad, but it was, there was very apparently a culture shock between those two groups. So I, I, I'm not going to say I believe it, you know, like I said, people fake all kinds of weird stuff on the internet, but it's not at least to me, like outside the realm of conception. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you, Vin Gold. Yeah. Okay. The, the big, uh, the big, uh, shocking ending was you kind of got this, it, it's two liberals arguing and it's, it's like, it's the obnoxious, like awful versus, uh, you know, the minority going back and forth. And uh, what you find out at the end is uh, has to be seen to be believed. But hold on a second. And this person didn't include the part two, which is, you know, again, this whole thing is just chaos. The, the, the thread is chaos. Every part about it is just wrong. But uh, let me find it. This is the last shot in the whole thing is that's her car. That's what her car looks like. And so for any sympathy that you had up until this point should be lost because um, <laughs> As somebody said in the comments, you know, I don't care who she is. If this, if you have that many stickers on your car, it's over. You're not going. What is to it? Make what it. does it say on our window? I, am I dyslexic? Because I, I cannot I, read that. No, I can't read it. I can't read it. Either. Uh, what does that even mean? I don't even know what that means. It's Get not her. even a lot of. They're not even like political stickers. It's just. Uh, it's like buy locally, uh, world peace. It's it's. Oh, you should read more. It's not even like political stickers. It's not campaign stickers. It's just like be a good person. Those are the stickers. Cur current thing. See, the worst part is like, and this is something the the left is incredibly good at, and that's taking good ideas and making them gay and cringe. Locally, like a great I kind example. of. Yeah, like I kind of agree with buying local, but like the moment I see someone like that do it, I'm like, eh. Hey, Shut up! I'm going to yeah. Walmart right now. Well, that's the that's the bodega controversy, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I'm I'm gonna need someone's got to get me up to speed on that because I don't know that one. Could you help me out with that? Oh, it's this innocent normie guy who was just posting on TikTok about how weirded out he was by all the ethnic bodegas and homosexuals in New York, and he got <laughs> he got like fired from his job, lionized by sort of the BAP crowd. But what did he say? Not much. He was like, oh, you know. I'm not used to this many gay people being around, you know, where can I buy? Like he was, he was looking for some like normal food. <laughs> Couldn't find any. Yeah. He bought an NAACP t-shirt to, um, <laughs> to, to get, get along with the colored people at his gym. I think something like oh. that. <laughs> it's my oh, big yeah, uh, recollection. I, I saw that guy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there definitely. Is... A tra oh, sorry. Keep going. I just said a, tra a tragedy of the modern uh, bug man uh, city, you know, yeah. The guy that responded to him also had peak bug man physiognomy, like that guy on TikTok. And the guy is just like a totally like zonked out leftoid too. He, he had like this really like totalitarian like message in another TikTok video that I saw being shared of like Bodega Bros, like uh, critic. It's, yeah, it's, uh, oh, <sighs> <laughs> okay all right Garak. i'll, I'll share this uh, yeah thank you charlamagne i appreciate okay i'm was the guy in the dress because i remember he walked to, to one person who was wearing a dress like a guy <laughs> not sure if it's the same person <laughs> though <laughs> <Same enemies. laughs> I've said this before, <laughs> but I feel like I've I've listened to enough Thomas that I now read Thomas 
speak like Thomas text as how he sounds. Yes. You know, the like it, it, <laughs> he has such a distinctive speaking pattern. And and I've said this before, but the the funniest thing he's ever done is when he was doing the stupid Jar Jar Pink stuff. Like I saw yeah. screenshots on my phone. It was so <laughs> funny. It was like weeping. It was so funny. No, I can't specifically oh, the frogs. Yeah. Specifically the uh, the the one that's transparent. Like I can't look at this image the same way again because <laughs> you can't, uh, you know. I mean, literally, like any other photo of him, you know, I can think about Star Wars. This I can't. It's just my mind doesn't go in that direction anymore because of Twitter. That's just what happens. You know? There's some website that had all the classic T T seven 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 tweets. So I'll see if I can find it. Oh, is that oh, right? Yeah, that I want to get my hands on. <laughs> no, I'll pull it up, man. I felt so bad because I, I never, never in your life think that even if it's like if you're it's late at night, don't think, hey, tomorrow morning the account will still be there. Don't ever say that in your head. It's not true. You you never know. So, oh, here we go. Yeah, that's the that's the website. Oh my goodness. Here we'll put it in the chat. But first of all, I just have to just have to show you what this looks like visually. Oh my <laughs> yeah. goodness. Oh my god. Oh no. Oh man. Um oh here take, we take your pick. No, for sure, for sure. Um yeah, yeah. Hold on a second. And a lot of it, some of it's from like Sallow Forum too. I think the website also has a separate section where they archive the whole forum. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right. The forum. No, that's true. No, for sure, for sure. Yeah, stuff like this. I know you, you've been finding the archive too, and so it's been a slow and steady journey. No, that's very accurate. I believe that. I mean, that. I mean, I witnessed it today. I mean, like literally, the the females in my life literally went to the Walgreens, and the first thing they wanted to buy was like one of those uh, one of those big rubber balls for like five year olds <laughs> for some weird reason because they're cute or something. <laughs> I don't know. The female mind is very weird. <laughs> It is uh, unique. It's distinct. Here, we'll 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 throw that in the chat. And uh, you know, copy and paste, guys. Copy and paste. That's your. Uh, it's one of your friends here. Some guy yeah. in the chat also wanted his greatest post, so I'll just drop that. Um... That post book. Yeah, I know That's the good. post. The post book is controversial. That's the thing. <laughs> it's oh. It the post book is shit. I didn't write it. I wasn't consulted on it and it sucks. So that's the verdict. That's the thing. You know, you can't just, uh, yeah, that's the other thing. He like actually writes books. So that's, what's ironic. The idea, like if, uh, I know somebody was saying how, uh, the Shane Stevens book probably got quadrupled in price. Thanks to him. That's, that's probably true. But, uh, yeah, if you, uh, if you're, if he's actually like working on long form, then uh, whoever that was, I don't know if it was Skeptical Waves or who else, but uh, yeah, that uh, that post is uh, specific to whoever whoever put it out there. So, and I'm not just trying to relentlessly show my own stuff. Like I, I get no money from my podcast; it's just fun. But uh, Thomas is coming on my show soon, and I, I think we're going to talk about because I've been thinking about this for a while. I really to go back to what he was saying about him writing books is uh, his book, Steelstorm, I really enjoyed. And I wanna, I wanna have a conversation about like, and this is something we can discuss as a panel, right? But essentially like the nature of how evil is written in fiction. Because mm. I, I kind of have a working hypothesis that, that because the progressives have kind of like a Rousseau, Rousseauian vision of kind of man as a blank slate, you know, where evil is something kind of imposed by society. I don't think they can really write like a bad character well, you know, so they either end up with kind of the sympathetic villain who kind of comes up to be too sympathetic, you know, and there are a lot of memes about characters like that, like the literally me characters are oftentimes that person, you know, or it's this like cartoonishly evil person from the past, right? So uh, like Pan's Labyrinth, you know, where the, the main villain is this like horrible raping, murdering, you know, like, a black hat wearing commissar figure, you know, who's like so absurd. It, it just like, it breaks the world. So I don't know. That's just something I've been thinking of. Oh yeah. Here, let me, I want to link uh, his actual writing. 
is here in chat. So there you go for anybody who uh, who needs it. Um, yeah, were you going to talk about it from a historical lens or was it up for grabs? I, at least personally, like I have no, I just, it's just been something I, and I, I normally like to like brainstorm like for at least a while before I do an interview to, you know, to figure that out. But this is like the most conceptual stage. It's just something that I think would be fun to talk about. Like I've got nothing concrete on that past that like very vague statement. Yeah. I was just earlier today listening to uh, Nigel Carl's bad. We'll, we'll try to get him on the show uh, in the near future, but yes, he was yes, yes. Yeah. Grok, Grok, he knows. I, he knows. I love Carl's bad. I, I, I said this on another stream. I would, I would go to battle for him. <laughs> There you go. That's right. That's right. He's uh, he's he's quite something. Um, he was talking to I think it was Aaron McIntyre on uh, Break the Rules with Geo, and he was describing how uh, uh, Machiavelli's uh, reputation is basically satanic. You know, as as far as the historical record uh, has to say for it, and it's you know it's been like in the reactionary spheres where his legacy has been kind of shifted into this you know more relevant kind of dynamic. And so he he kind of calls into question, you know, should should we look Machiavelli? I think it was uh, who was it Bertrand Russell, who that was like the only guy that he wrote about from that the Renaissance era. And so you know, did somebody who's you know kind of got some things to you know the separation of man and religion that he talked about, you know, is that kind of the beginning of idolatry and stuff like that? It, it's an interesting question. I I don't really have a stance at the moment here, but. I think Leo, Leo Strauss calls him the first sort of modern part of the first wave of modern uh, philosophers with Hobbes and um, Locke as well. Right. And so having that be his legacy, if that is his legacy, I obviously Thomas would have uh, some words on it, too. That's just one of those things. It's, it's weird from my perspective because, you know, I've only read him from the right wing perspective. And, you know, obviously, you know, it's it's like uh Garak, I remember you were telling me about the divine right of kings and sort of the baggage that is around that too. You know, it's just these things that we take for granted could uh, could easily we could easily see its limitations if we talk about it with somebody. So, so that might be a, a good starting point. Just a vague, you know, just a vague advice. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, Rousseau though, Rousseau. That's a good. That's another one that uh, that was the one that woke me up to uh, understanding the left in a more historical terms. But yeah, but that is that's interesting. Maybe yeah, Rousseau and Paradise Lost are very great for that, for understanding the the genesis of their thought. Mostly, I would say. So there's a book that I've I've recommended a few times, and it's like Marx, it's probably Marxist. eighty percent of a good book. You know, it's a little over long, but uh, this guy Carl Truman uh, has this book, The Triumph of the Modern Self, which I think is really important. Because he essentially traces the, that train of thought that runs, you know, through Rousseau and people like Shelley and then into people like Freud and then how that kind of dovetails with the, like the modern, like instantiation of, of that thought that we deal with. It, it's, it's really good. It's, I, I struggle to recommend it fully because it is a little overly long, but all the same, it does kind of follow that idea. So I think it's pretty, if you're interested in it, I'd recommend it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Let me. All right, guys. I'm gonna tap out. It's it's getting pretty late on uh, in my part of the world. But uh, it was good to talk sure. to you, and it's good to meet you guys. I'll uh, I'll see you guys later. All yeah, right, see you later. Good to see you. Happy hey, Independence happy Day. Uh, uh, Yank. Right. Thank you all. Yankee good night. friend. That's right. That's right. All righty. All righty. Now, Char now Charlemagne can be honest in the chats. You love to see it. Here we Hello, go. Charlemagne Dunley, her favorite NRX guy. Original OG. Yo, yo, OG NRXers in chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh Grok, what a because I wanna I wanna shill some of some of Carlsbad's, you know, his uh his his latest project that we've talked about in the past, but I'm just mainly looking for a good excuse to bring him on because obviously he's got a lot to say. But uh He's, uh, <laughs> I know he's been busy with some uh, some other things, uh, tw Twitter wise, but uh, yeah, it just seems like he's putting together all his uh, papers together. So I, I like seeing that stuff. Um, let me just go over to his uh, 
as a. Oh, well, he's got two now. He's got um, he's got his his normal blog, the uh, Carlsbad eighteen nineteen at uh, WordPress, which is pretty good. It's it's sort of where he archives all of his legitimist counter counter enlightenment sort of Hollerite um, writings, historical documents. Most of it, most of it's about sort of, I would I would say nineteenth century Europe, here and there. Um, and then, in addition to that, recently he's been doing a project on c the conceptual history of the mass democratic age at the Substack uh, Begriskeshikta. I'll have to put that in. Oh, uh, is that okay? I see. I don't think I've seen that. That's his most it's recent fun. project. Scott Greer has been chilling it a lot. Um, mm. it, it it'll take a while to explain, but it's sort of. He's trying to do a conceptual history to clear up the confusion around ideologies on them. Um, well, in the world generally, but I think particularly um, dissident right Twitter. I think I hear some fireworks outside. What the? I'll put this in chat. What the? <laughs> well, that's good to hear, Charlemagne. That's uh, that is quite that is quite a. I'd say that's a positive development. Um, yeah, that that specific talk with Carlsbad and uh, McIntyre to me that's very relevant now, especially in the uh, after that Vanity Fair article, everyone making sense of it. I just th and especially after AA did that video, uh, I think it was like the uses and abuses of NRX. Uh, that debate, I don't know how old that is. Let me, in fact, let me just find that one real quick. It should be in my YouTube history. Um, one second. Oh no no no. Yeah, people should probably go back and rewatch that because it's funny. McIntyre kind of talks for most of it, but the takeaway is uh, okay. That's good optics. Uh, the, the takeaway is uh, is uh, I don't know. I, I feel like it kind of goes into uh, Carlsbad's favor with his uh, with his commentary, especially again with all the stuff that's happened since. How long ago is this? Last year, almost a year ago. So uh, yeah, I think that's that's worth. Uh, that's worth revisiting. Uh, of course, a lot of stuff has happened since. He hasn't done many interviews, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It, they're basically all on YouTube. You can find them in one search. I, I'd say watch them all. They're all pretty interesting. Yeah, that's he's been right. on. Yeah. He's been on highly respected. Yeah, him and Scott, him and uh, Imperium Cast. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. Well, he's not. He's not really on su such friendly terms with Imperium Cast anymore. Oh, some uh, some ideological some some ideological debates. He's, he's been light. He had a bit of a light feud with uh, Joel Davis. Ah, uh, I, yeah, I can't imagine. Can't imagine. No, that's that's. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Charlie, I think uh, I think he got into a fight with on Twitter with him. I kind of vaguely <laughs> remember. I kind of vaguely remember that because he is quite anti NRX. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of the crux of the whole v debate, and uh, it kind of basically turned into a discussion. So. Uh, I need to re-listen. Okay, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, I guess that's open to interpretation, Oscar. Um, by the way, Oscar, we're we're still we're still in the Ivan Neville mindset. Okay, we're still we're just trying to extend that as much as possible. Okay, I'm trying to keep you in my mind as much as I can. But we'll oh, it's funny though. I, I originally found out about Thomas because of AA. He brought him on AA. I never heard of him before then. Oh, really? So that was a really great experience find thomas for the first time yeah how long was that uh was that april does that sound right march I'm, it's I'm around that time i'm trying to i'm trying to like i don't know it just seems like so much has happened since then it's uh it's quite something um yeah let me find let me find the twitter real quick Here we go. <laughs> we're uh, we're uh, calling out the Lutherans. That's the first tweet I see. All right, we're we're all right. Here we go. Cause I, yeah. Well, we'll see what we can do. I uh, again, I'm in a similar spot as Jay Burden, as I'm trying to find an excuse to. Uh, to get this thing moving so yeah we'd like to uh we'd like to build that bridge i don't know when that was we originally reached out but uh we can definitely send him another message but uh 
But all right, all right. Well, that's that's all I got. I uh, this is what happens when you don't have a script. You uh, just sort of meander along here. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you for that. Yeah, we can wind down here for the so that this doesn't turn into. Uh, I forgot who that was in chat. Uh, yeah, last stream not ideal towards the end. We got into some dinosaur gang. That was that was positive. Besides that, not much, not much to be proud of there. So we can uh, we can wind down here if everyone wants to shill their uh, their latest project, their latest links. I'll do that in the chat here while you guys are popping off. So starting with Jose, could we uh, could we get your two cents? Yeah, check out my Substack, Jose Nino Unfiltered. That's also where my podcast, El Nino Speaks, is at. I recently interviewed. James Edwards of the polit political cesspool and George Samueli of the gaggle. We, I talk about a whole host of issues on my podcast from like immigration to foreign policy. So check out my work there. Excellent. Um, American populist. Uh, let me get your, well, you can find me on my channel, which is American populist, but I, tomorrow I'm going to be on Jay Burden's show uh, for four. So I'll be a great discussion, but hopefully I'm going to have, a couple of more epic interviews coming up. I'm also going to have some more scripted content coming up again because my last one uh, was pretty did pretty well. Uh, I really really appreciate that video. Neil Gaston's in case you know, didn't watch it. It was a pretty good video. Also follow um, me on Twitter. It's at American Populist if you're interested in checking it out. By the way, uh, does it make you a little bit upset that when I Google your name, the American Populist Union comes up? Is that a... No, no, no that's fine, because I actually work with the AP. Well, uh, it's actually American Cause now, but <laughs> officially, but yeah. That's right, yeah, breaking news. Um, they're starting to change my mind on the on the minion question. I, I'm not all the way there yet, but, you know, maybe those guys can talk me into it. We'll see what happens, you know. Not, not saying anything for sure as of now. Let me get your... Let me get the Twitter because even if some people aren't on board yet, I, I still I still think it's worth advertising. And then of course, Barack Obama. You recently had an appearance on a a podcast. I I, I can't remember exactly where that was at. Uh, yeah, I was recently on a a new a new Substack coming out. Sort of people in people in the uh, Carlsbad sphere, people in the conceptual history sphere had me on for their inaugural episode, which I was very honored to take part in. Um, the substack is Das Denkenmut. Uh, I believe that's the courage, the courage to think. And I'll just pop that link uh, into the chat. Yeah, here I'll... Uh, we just went I'll... over, we went over the German New Right, character wash, historicism. And basically, it was a nice place to go over some of the projects I'm getting, I've been doing. That's a segue into... Uh, the, there are two substacks that I've been doing. One is characterwash.substack.com, which is a translation of an old book about denazification, which Paul Gottfried cites extensively in his book, The Strange Death of Marxism. Um, so that's the first thing I have to shill. Then for original content, I've gotten off the ground a substack called Unreconstructed, which is where I put my original writings. And mostly it's been going over similar t subjects, sort of the nationalist populist distinction some analysis of Paul Gottfried's books. And um, I also did a short thing about the Confederate flag. Um, yeah, that's all I have to um, chill for now. Yeah, no, that uh, specifically that link up on the screen there, that one specifically, I think a lot of people in chat would be, uh, would be interested in. Um, that was one that I was uh, listening late at night about. Um, Charlemagne to, uh, to answer your question, you know, this is kind of the new, uh, this is the new controversy. You know, these Zoomers, they're always fighting. They're always finding something to uh, critique. This Minions movie, it's, you know, it's, it kind of represents, you know, right-wing authoritarianism, but it's not very funny. So, you know, the Minion meme, it's, it's kind of our thing, but at what point can you stretch it out to where, it's kind of outlived its usefulness. I, from what I've been told, I'm hearing mixed things about this new movie. It's only like 70 minutes long thereabouts. So it's not the end of the world, but again, we're, we're really milking this meme and I just don't know if it's stale yet. It probably is to be honest, but uh, you know, you got the AF people who are against it. APU is shilling it. 
it's very chaotic. I'm not sure, you know, where we're going to go from here. This is going to be the new rift. And uh, I don't know, the the American right may not survive this. Uh, this might be the, the straw that falls back. So we'll see. I don't know. I'm not sure. But we'll see what happens. Isn't it a movie for, quote, little babies? Uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't know. It's, it's uh, listen, it's, uh, I, I can't, I can't really say. Uh, prob probably. I thought there'd be more Elvis discourse. That's sort of like a throwback to the 50s and Americana and... That's true. It's funny you mentioned that because I saw Elvis today. I thought it was pretty good. Actually. You did? Okay. I saw it. I thought the movie was pretty good, although it did have pause elements in it, but I really liked it. So this is going to be a four-hour show. American Populous, what, did you, what are your first thoughts? <laughs> but... Okay, well, now I'm the movie reviewer guy, but I thought it was a pretty good movie. I mean, I didn't know much about the guy, but... What was... Flashback. What, what was some of the pause, specifically? Well, there's this one blacks. scene where uh, Elvis is, like, starting to become famous with his manager. Uh, I forgot what his name was, you know, the colonel. And then uh, this the senator of Tennessee at the time is like, this guy's being way too Negro friendly, and he's, he's uh, promoting, he's going to destroy our culture with the Negro music and the hip dancing. And he's, like, telling the manager, hey, you got him to stop, otherwise he's going to, you know, Band of on TV and stuff, Dan Elvis. Like, they're just portraying him in this like negative light, you know. Praying. And he, of course, he has like the Southern like flag in the background. He's at this meeting. So right. they had to like put that in there, of course. Right. And I, for the record, I, I don't know if we have it confirmed what uh, his views were on segregation. That's sort of like a media thing that's out there. There's no, I, you know, the, you would think they would have a quote by now if there was something that was really concrete, but th they don't really seem to go for that. It's all this kind of vague, you know, what you think he would like, you know, the MLK stuff is another point in the movie where, uh, you know, well, yeah, that... in the movie, they give this impression that he's like, you know, the civil rights guy. He's like, yeah, I'm okay. Right. Because and... his past is obviously comes from Mississippi. So. Right. And it's like, again, we're talking about a, a guy with Southern roots. So again, it's not a given that he's an egalitarian. He's sort of in the Murray Rothbard camp as far as, you know, maybe he's not a, a Southerner and like the as far as, as far as dating, dating teenagers. <laughs> well, okay. Well, <laughs> that's a, that's a separate issue. That's a whole separate tangent, but you know, it, it, it's worth reminding people that in, and this is mentioned in the movie and this is one of the most, the best things that Tom Hanks says the fact that the world was literally changing at, at the same time as Elvis's career, that's, that's really the crux here. It, the fact that it's going in this racial direction, again, that's, I think, is projection. I, that's not the stuff that I think is really motivating a lot of Elvis's arc. It's just, I think it's just kind of lazy to kind of assume that that's the case, like you said, with the MLK influencing the 68 comeback. No, then you like have these, these friends. I'm not sure who they are. I'm not that big into music, but. They like tell him, you know, after it's uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. was shy, like you got to make a message about this, you know, you got to do it. So then they make this thing where he has to, you know, have a voice. Basically, it's like the pre-celebrity stuff with the, you know, you know, signaling their support for the current thing. Right, and the narratives get kind of they get kind of contradictory. Like either he's the guy who stole black music and so he only cares about himself or he's the civil rights hero that wanted to do it, but the Colonel held him back. It's two narratives that they're throwing at you at the same time. And so that's kind of, I think a red flag that that wasn't the case. And so it, it's unfortunate that that's in the movie. Um, speaking of uh, current American citizen, uh, one of his mutuals, obese goth was talking about how, you know, that scene with segregation specifically, it really makes a good case of Elvis being a bad guy. And, you know, this is supposed to be the the romantic Elvis movie. And it's actually kind of compelling to someone like me uh, that he's not, you know, he's not someone to defend, unfortunately. So it's kind of working on a bunch of different levels. But, you know, look, uh, I don't think there's any proof that he was egalitarian. So I think we're just going to have to shove that aside, not let that ruin the experience. There's, uh, you know, plenty, plenty of good value in that movie, regardless, regardless of the pause. Um, I don't know this, this director's, I don't know his angle. I know in Australia, there was a lot of political stuff. I think uh, that had to do with the South or, or so I, I forget exactly what it was, but uh, um, 
I'm just not an expert on his uh, catalog. So I, I'm not going to pretend like I know that stuff, but, but Elvis specifically, I, I think, I think that he's pretty much on our side for the most part. And uh, a lot of people don't want to admit that because, because he's the guy, but okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, but yeah, no, that's good to hear. I, I tried to get obese goth on here, but scheduling conflicts were in the way of that, but I oh, still, I'm still happy to give my feedback on it. <laughs> What's that? I'm happy to give my feedback on it. I thought it was pretty good. You know, first movie yeah. I've seen in like a year or two. The last movie I saw was a uh, star Wars, the, the return of skyward for the way this one with the uh, Ray. And it was just, yeah. Terrible. yeah. <laughs> that was the last movie. It was pre COVID though. So no, 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 that's uh that's definitely an upgrade, but yeah, we're, I, 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 it's our movie. Okay. You, you see this stuff coming out with the Barbie film. It's, it's very disappointing. Okay. And so I just want people to remember that this is a lot more closer to us and our thing compared to uh, whatever Ryan Gosling's up to right now. It's, it's, it's not looking so good. Unfortunately, you, you hate Barbie, to see this Barbie stuff. Core. <laughs> I know, I know. I don't think we're even going to be able to LARP with that. I think it's still going to, you know, some people have been speculating. I think it was Sherman McCoy. I think that's the one who blew the whistle. But I don't know, man. It's looking like it's going to be paused, unfortunately. Technically, the Elvis one is a little, but the I think you can still salvage it. This Barbie one, not so sure. It's, uh, I, I'm just, that's my prediction for now. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'll eat my words. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it can survive. We'll see. But, uh. Yeah, okay. We got a Doors discussion. Yeah, today was the day that Jim Morrison died, so a lot of anniversaries today. Rip, rip. That's kind of unfortunate. That's kind of the, the 60s Elvis. That Actually, that's more of the counterculture Elvis who uh, sort of embraced the uh, the negative aspects of the counterculture. So so we got that. We got that. He's dead in the Fed. I was, let's just wind it down. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Is that the stance we're going to take is the, the Fed argument? Possibly. Another stream, another stream. <laughs> it is. There may be some CIA connections there. I don't know. <laughs> it is. That's the, what is it? David McGowan. It, it's really weird. The intelligence connection. I, you know, his dad was on the Gulf of Tonkin. I, I don't, it's, it's weird. It's just a weird coincidence. I don't know. But, uh, but no, but you know what? But maybe that's salvageable too. Who knows? It's all up in the air as far as I'm concerned. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, it's not looking good as uh, from my perspective, but we'll, we'll see. Um, okay. All right. We're calling it. That's, uh, that's our three, basically three hour show. Uh, thank you, raging man. Joe. appreciate you seeing here. You're, you're leaving at the perfect moment. So thank you guys. We got all your plugins. I got to update the description. Everybody's we got a, was not expecting a, a doom panel, but we got it. I'm glad we got it. So thank all you guys for uh, tuning in. Thank you guys for joining on short notice holiday weekend. And uh, hope you guys enjoy your 4th of July. You guys are all over the world. I think for Garak, it already is or uh, something, something. Yeah, yeah. There saying. it is on the East Coast. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. We got East Coast people. Okay, okay. I'm on the East Coast. So, yeah. so, okay, we got all kinds. All right, so we're already there for some of us, but... Thank you guys for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Happy 4th of July, everybody in chat. Thank you guys for tuning in and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you.